Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remko Rinkema, and today I am joined by the godfather of PLO, Poppy, <laughs> the Tom Dwan Whisperer, as I love to call him, Mr. Joey Ingram. Joey, thanks so much for joining me. I got season five of High Stakes Poker queued up. I don't think I could do anything more than that to, to get you on the show here, but first and foremost, how are you doing? Thank you, brother. Very nice to see you. Shout out to everybody out there watching on YouTube, on Facebook. Yeah, man, you, uh, we talked about doing this next week, but you said, uh, can I have you on today? So I said, all right, let's make it happen. Let's go. I'm kind of in like a content hiatus right now, studying, figuring out what I want to do next. So happy to be here and happy to watch some high stakes. Po I mean, you got the legend Tom Dwan, buddy, right? This is, uh, yeah, we his, got his we... episodes. Are so are, are so I've watched all of these, like, I don't know, about 10 or 15 times I've watched high stakes poker throughout it. So it's one of my favorite shows. It was super inspiring when it was on back in the day. So yeah, I love it, man. I'm ready, I'm ready to get into it. I love it. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, we got season five of High Stakes Poker. For people who are new to this show, let me tell you, this is Run It Back. We break down action from the past, whether it's WSOP, Poker After Dark, or High Stakes Poker, as it is the case today. We are going to go back through it, watch some of these amazing hands, do a little bit of analysis of these hands, but mostly we're in here for the stories and some good old banter surrounding some of these epic moments of poker history. As you can see right now, the intro is running of High Stakes Poker season five for the people who are with me in the last few weeks you will you will remember this because we are watching season five all the way throughout we did episode one and two three and four and today we're doing five and six and you know we got to number seven queued up as well so it's going to be a long one so crack open a cold one grab some chips and enjoy the ride because tom dwan is ready for some action and so are we uh joey you said you've already watched this stuff numerous times <laughs> so 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 let me tell you uh the joey ingram of, of back in the day when high stakes poker season one first aired and we're talking you know 2006 you know, what were you up to back in that era? Were you aspiring to be on high stakes poker? And, and was there was the dream ever close to becoming a reality? Uh, well, back back 2006, I think I was just like, uh, what was I about 21. So I think I was going to the Majestic Star Casino outside Chicago. I'd go play the one two there after I got done work and I'd go lose all my money at the uh, one two table because I didn't know about bankroll management. But then once I found Poker Stars and I found two plus two and I found bankroll management and I found 10 cent, 25 cent, five cent, 10 cent that was uh that was when my life kind of changed so it was it was after a few seasons in though so i didn't really start with the first episode uh back in the day kind of when it came out but yeah it was definitely i feel like if high stakes poker was around all the time in the future that i'll play at some point in time and if it was more like plo i was mainly only playing high stakes plo so there was never a high stakes poker for Potlum in omaha unfortunately so right yeah that's definitely too bad uh plo was featured on many other cash game shows but not on high stakes poker which was uh, strictly no limit and for anyone wondering why are these dudes talking over the action well that's because all this action is available on poker go so if you want to watch all seven seasons of this action without anyone talking other than uh, aj benza and gabe kaplan in, in the later seasons norm mcdonald please go and do so uh, we are bringing back high stakes poker Poker Season 8 is coming to Poker Go. Of course, COVID is putting a little bit of a damper on that whole situation, but we are excited to get that ball rolling as soon as we can. And please let us know in the chat which players you would like to see on Season 8 of High Stakes Poker. We, obviously, that's going to be a big one. Um, Joey, I have to ask you, even though I probably already know the answer, and I'm going to assume that Tom Dwan was your favorite player to watch, but give me like a top three of like High Stakes Poker characters that you most enjoyed to watch. Uh, well, definitely Sammy Farha. I think Sammy Farha is one of the one of my number one favorite people to watch on the show. I think uh, Tom Dwan obviously was always really fun to watch on the show too. Uh, Daniel always came in there and kind of mixed it up in his own way. But David Benjamin is hilarious. The guy's like he always talks in his French accent and he's willing to put play a lot of hands, puts a lot of money in the pot. I mean, I don't know Jamie Gold, Gila Liberté, Doyle Brunson. There was a lot of really really epic people to watch. So, exactly you know, top three. I'd have to think a little bit more about it. Right, yeah, we do have we do have an iconic cast of characters in every single one of these seasons. Uh, Benjamin taking it down with a two pair against the straight draw of Daniel Harry. So yeah, um, as it is the cadence on this show, every now and then we'll tune in to a big hand, and there are going to be quite a few big hands here on this show. Um, Joey, going back in time a little bit because I'm kind of curious about this. Um, your ascension through the ranks was that a quick process, or was it all that mass multi-tabling that had you sort of making a, a good amount of money every month, and you were sort of like, well, why, do, why would I move up? You know, making good money playing all these tables, and you know, the win rate's good enough. Yeah, I think back then you were able to make money from the rakeback system on Poker Stars with Supernova Elite, so you could always, uh, I mean, you could basically break even and make over hundred thousand dollars. So for me, I would always try moving up stakes 
while 24 tabling and trying to get that top reward status program and the guarantee hundred thousand dollars. So essentially once I stopped doing that was when I got to move up stakes pretty easily because you could play in really good games and you're just a lot more focused. You're able to put more time in each decision. And, and when you 24 table, you're basically building out a different kind of strategy versus when you're three and four tabling and you're actually game selecting a little bit too. So once I gave up the supernova elite dream after I got it a couple years in a row was when it, it was probably a really good decision. It was just a lot more stressful instead when you're going through like $10,000 swings every day. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's very stressful. So in retrospect, maybe it was, wasn't the best decision, you know, right. It may have been the best decision to move up stakes, but where it led to, maybe not. Right. All right. We got Kings for Barry making it 5k Tom Vaughn nine do suited. That was a hand that people played back in the day. At least if your name was Tom Vaughn. Yeah. Tom Vaughn's always known for making like really, uh, really, really wide three bets, wide four bets. He was pretty much one of the only guys on this show that was willing to three bet with the nine deuce of clubs. <laughs> wow. It's still crazy to think about. Uh, do you think the Tom Dwan of 2020 would get this kind of creative? 100%. Yeah. I mean, I think you see like a Garrett Adelstein, who's a better player playing on uh, live at the bike when he does play against some players that are weaker. You see him mix it up. So, yeah, I think like a player with a really aggressive style who doesn't mind playing really wide hands pre flop, I think definitely we, we would see more plays like that. And I think we do see plays like that amongst the high stakes games if you, uh, when they're on and when you watch them. Right. Ellie is out of position in the big blind, gives up his ace jack offsuit. Of course, you know, very understandable. Um, I can only imagine Barry's going to, you know, put the pedal to the metal here, or maybe he's going to, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Makes it 100K. Uh, is there is there a good argument there to be made for Barry to flat and, and you know, have Dwan spaz off on the flop because, you know, his range is so, going to be so wide? Well, it, well, it seems like, uh, you know, against Tom Dwan, he was always willing to call four bets pretty light. And he would have a wider three bet range than normal. So a lot of players didn't necessarily take a big slow play route against him. They decided, okay. Plus it looks like he's always three betting. So sometimes you're going to want to four bet. So I think that uh, players usually played pretty aggressive against Tom. There's very rare. I mean, I don't think we saw really any big slow play type hands in that sort of spot against Tom Dwan. Right. So had the pleasure to play against Tom. Has it ever happened? No, definitely. I, I don't think so. No. I mean, maybe online at some point in time, maybe like on poker stars, I don't know or what screams he was playing on, but no, not that I know of, not like in person or anything like that. I don't think people in America have really seen too much of him except the random Ivy's room and Bobby's rooms adventures uh, over the recent years anyway. So it is, it is kind of crazy though, how even after all these years, he still has this mythical sort of status in the game of poker. Um, and, and, and a lot of that came from high stakes poker and, and poker after dark, always playing in the big cash games. But then let's pivot to a guy like Zygmunt that we're watching right now. Um, would you say that with a bit more, you know, luck on these TV cash games, Zygmunt could have gotten a bit more of that status? Or do you think he was definitely a tier below Dwan on, on the pecking order there? Well, he was mainly known as a Potlin Omaha player. So I, even when he played this show, I was always confused because I didn't really see him play much high stakes hold'em. And I think that uh, you just need to get more you need to get more and more and more repetition in terms of like being on, on coverage. So he was very rarely on any sort of poker shows in Vegas. He lived in Europe. So I think it's just really hard for him to be able to do that. Right. You know what I mean? But he was definitely a legend of the game back in the day. We, we saw him on the broadcast as well. We did run it back last week. I have any idea if Zygmunt still, you know, mixing it up? Do you still talk to your Finnish, your Finnish Intel? Is he still playing? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much he's playing, really. I talked to the Finnish people a little bit, but I'm not sure what Sigmund's up to. He's obviously like a, a classic character in the poker world of all time. So I think a lot of people really, really enjoyed his little antics in the chat and stuff like that. Yeah, and we'll never forget the time that he was a heads up in a lab event in, in Finland and just walked away from the table. And I think they found him in the bathroom, or at least, you know, he was, uh, he was, he was not, he was not like totally there but he he did manage to get heads up, heads up in this tournament um uh you know he's a, he's a good drinker and he's probably going to be the best guy to run into uh funny funny zygmunt story uh when i was at ept copenhagen back in 2009 my first ever um ept in copenhagen uh, zygmunt was playing real heaven in the lobby on a laptop with about 100 people behind him watching in in the lobby of the radisson uh blue hotel and all i was thinking is Someone could just text these hands to all these people, but Zygmunt was just drinking tequila and he didn't care and he was playing 501k back in those days. Um, 
Joey, do you miss it? Do you miss the the old heyday of those big high stakes online games, or or has that new era of or, of whatever it is that is going on online right now that we know nothing about, or at least you know not out in the open in the public, uh, is is that replacing it for you a little bit? Um, well, the new stuff I've been watching a little bit of it. I haven't been watching it too much. I'm pretty sure that it could. I think just like the way that I view high stakes poker these days in general is a lot different than how I view it back then. But I think if it went on for a while and we got to know the players and got to know the characters involved, which is what what looks like it's going to happen, then I think it there's more of a reason for you to care or be interested and uh, just give you kind of something to follow, something to connect to, something to invest in, something to to root for and cheer for and cheer against and stuff like that. So. It certainly could happen. There's just also a lot of content out these days in all different parts of the world. So there's a lot more temptation in terms of what you might spend your time watching and poker wise or any any content wise, really. All right, we got another one here. It's Negranu raising it up with the King Queen. Duan calling this time with his Jack. Let's see where this goes. Grabbing a duck. Went to sea in a beautiful green pea boat. Remember that? No. I don't. The kids home about the crab and the duck. Well, there's another duck on the pond right there, but Dwan's paired his jack. Forget about Dwan pairing his jack. Ellie's paired his duck. <laughs> it's true. And Dwan bets 13,200. And there goes the crab and the duck yeah. walking away together. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like an easy one there for Dwan. Or maybe, well, maybe, he's thinking that Dwan is maybe Daniel's going to get brave here. here speeding a little bit. So he's going to call with king high. He actually would take the lead with a king or a queen. And four. Four's not going to do it. Maybe if Dwan checked, Daniel would try and buy the pot. But Dwan probably thinks Daniel might have a weaker jack or 9, 10, a hand like that. So he doesn't want him to draw. So it looks like he's going to bet here. He's going to bet 34,200. Daniel is gone. All right, that hand is not going anywhere. Dwan takes it down with top pair there. Uh, for the people who are watching this in the chat, please let me know if you have any questions for Joey, any questions about the game, anything that's on your mind, please let us know. It's a safe space. It's Thursday night. Let's all unwind and have some fun. Uh, Chris is mentioning in the YouTube chat the Sexton Tribute is a must-watch, in my opinion. Yes, on Sunday, we are running the 2006 Tournament of Champions, the entire final table it's a 90 minute broadcast on on youtube and facebook for everyone to watch the um the mike sexton bracelet win million dollars in the grano in that event back in 06 um one of my favorite final tables i already broke it down with daniel on run it back uh, this was many months ago before we knew mike was uh, was ill uh, joey of course this news has you know hit us all hard I, I don't really you know even know what to say about it mike has been such an inspiration for me uh arguably the greatest ambassador the game has ever seen um you know, you put a video on, on Twitter as well about this, um, you know, tr try putting it in your own words, how you how you feel about it. Yeah, I mean, it's really sad. You know, I think about it as I'm, you know, you, you get emotional. I was getting real emotional about it. And I'm like, you know, I'm kind of thinking, OK, well, do I want to make some YouTube content? So I got some ideas for things I want to put up about him and just talk more about the impact he's had on me. But it really sucks because he's like a guy that's loved poker forever. And, uh you know, he loves poker forever. And like, he's one of the top ambassadors that people love and he, and he makes the game look good. And he's done so much for the game that it's really sad to just think about like losing someone like that. And then like a personal level, just, I was supposed to have him on my podcast next week and I was going to do some content with him. And, and I mean, you know, I was really looking forward to, to having him back on the show. So just, it's just, it's just like, it's just, I don't know. It really sucks, man. It's heartbreaking in some ways because, but there's been so much crazy shit that's happened this year. And then you know what I mean? It just you deal with all this emotion, and I, it's just been real challenging for me to kind of deal with. So, yeah, it, it's really it's really crazy. Um, Mike, Mike and I were you know on very good t terms. I had him on my, on my podcast quite a few times. The the best storyteller in the game, and um, wow, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what to say. It's probably not the right, no this show is probably not the right, right time to dive too deep into that. But uh, I just want to let everyone know that you know we are. We're paying tribute to Mike on, on Sunday with that broadcast. So, you know, Mike's still with us. He's in hospice care right now for people who are unfamiliar with the situation. Uh, Linda Johnson on uh, Twitter is, is providing, you know, information on, on Mike um, as it develops. And, you know, he can have my one time. And, you know, if, if, there's, a, if there's a miracle possible, then, you know, let's hope Mike finds one. 
Um, yeah, it's tough to pivot from that back into the show, but let's uh, let's try to do that. And and I know Mike loves poker, and he's always loved poker, and you know, that's why you and I are here. That's why how we got to this point, and that's how we got to watching high stakes poker. And you know, let's just jump into this hand to you know move move on a little bit in that sense. Um, Negrano with the flush draw, um, 44k in the middle there against the Lazarus Aces. Uh, let's just listen in and see where this goes. Ellie's going to raise to 119,100. How much more are you playing? About 100. 100 more after the 75? Close, close. Daniel's only got 44,000 invested. Both players have about $225,000. Daniel cannot just call. He'd be committing so much money that he's either got to go all in here yeah. or throw his hand away. I mean, Joey, I do, I do want to say flush draws were way cooler back in the day, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, they were, they were, they were definitely the rage, yeah. Well, <laughs> As you can see here, right, just putting in the 226,000 with the, uh, <laughs> you know, with the flush draw. Ten high flush draw, that is all. The ace of clubs, so you know Daniel doesn't have a hand like the ace five of clubs or the ace three of clubs. He's probably putting Daniel on a flush draw or a set, but he's getting, I think, almost four to one on his money. I don't understand why. He has wow, what's taking already. so long, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, Ellie's not going to fully put 119,000 in, so he's got aces. I mean, he's not pulling. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the Rose is going to play too. So, what are we pulling for? Leave the Rose. Twice good for you, sir. Twice is good. Twice is good. I got a flush draw. I got the A-side club flush draw. You do not, you liar. <laughs> <laughs> you got a pair? Aces. All right. I need a club. I'll take half. They've greedy. agreed to run it twice. Just Daniel. a casual half a million dollar pot with the old tan high flush draw. No big deal. And Daniel must know he has no fold equity, right? I mean, what's, what's Ellie going to raise, raise fold there in that spot? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think Daniel's just gambling, right? I think he liked to do this a lot. And there was a lot more gambling kind of happening on this show in general back during this time period. Plus, they usually run it twice, so it's easy to sometimes justify to yourself that maybe I do have some full equity, and at worst, we can run it twice. That's That, that sort of run it twice thing seems like a bit of a, a, a cop-out or at least, um, I guess, an invitation to splash around. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of players do that still in the games, right? Like when you play and you're playing live poker and run it twice as an option, you see a lot of players who take advantage of that. I mean, getting to know which players really love running it twice and maybe make some plays that they wouldn't normally make is something that you can work at and get better at when you go, when you go play poker. Some of these sites online run it twice now too, so you could pay attention to that as well. So are you, are you a fan of that or do you think that it just, I don't know. I mean, of course, you know, it, 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 invites action it de decreases variance in a way but it's it's also kind of like removing that um bloody nature of of these games in some kind of way yeah i usually just run it once personally so i try to avoid that and get that out of my mind and i let people know that i'm gonna run it one time so there's sometimes on occasion i'll run it twice if it's like a really massive pot and it might hurt if i end up losing a really big pot then but for the most part i just like to go one time and kind of get rid of all that sort of thinking in my own mind when i play because i just haven't played enough with run it twice, I mean, I guess you'd have to start playing to see how people might change against you and their strategies might change against you. So is it a fact or is it, is it a thing that you sit down in a PLO uh, table in a live casino? And by the way, let me, let me preface this by saying that I've never seen you tweet about a losing session, so I don't know how you do it. But, you know, it seems like every single time you play live, you walk away with at least, you know, 500 big blinds. Um, but do you, do you sit down and, and remind people constantly of the fact that you only run it once just so you get I mean, more full like equity? Yeah, you're not like drawing a bunch of attention to it. No, so, but yeah, that's what uh, that's why I always wish I, w I probably should play more live poker. But I just don't play a ton of live poker. I just prefer to play online. And been playing a lot lately. You can play a bunch of tables at one time. To me, I'd rather play four or five tables versus just one table right now. So, right, that makes sense. All right, we got Eastgate putting in the twenty thousand with pocket queens after a raise and a call from Ellie and uh, Zygmunt. Ellie calls with the ace jack of or sorry ace nine of diamonds. And Zygmunt just quickly tosses in the 15-5 with the pocket fours. With this much money on the table. Would anybody else do that at this table? Well, Juan would throw away 10s for sure. Nah, that's a joke, right? Yeah, it's a joke, AJ. All right. Ellie flops a flush draw, and there's an overcard to Peter Eastgate's queens. 
I mean, for the people who have been with this show for the last few weeks, they know that Eastgate has been getting absolutely crushed by everyone. And Elezra bets 55,000. Ran bad some of these spots, and there was a couple of big hands that he's kind of famous for being involved with, but we didn't necessarily see him on the show getting to, you know, too many spots where he's making like, uh, I mean, there was that one hand. There, there's a pretty epic hand. I think it might be in this episode or the next one. Tough spot here. What do you, what are you thinking in this case situation here? I mean, I think I'd just be confused. Like, why is this guy betting so big into me? Right. Most people, they're not going to, if they have King queen here or something like that, they have ace king, they're going to raise pre-flop. If they have King queen, King Jack, they're most likely just going to check call. So it's very weird that someone would lead into you so big. I don't think Peter Eastgate would call a big bet here now. I mean, this this would have been the moment for Ellie to swing for the fences. Yeah, I think once you get called there, you're you're putting your opponent on ace king. I mean, they might once again they might just go all in with ace king on the flop. So what kind of hand are you putting them on? King queen, maybe a flush draw as well too. Pocket queens, pocket jacks. No, he's not going to bet either. I can't imagine Peter was uh, three betting super well pre flop as well too. Right. It would look like but as far as from Ellie's perspective, like what are you leading to the flop with that you're, that you're checking the turn? So you're sort of giving up at, at that point, right? Uh, I don't know if he's going to give up. I, I imagine he'll probably check call one more depending on what size the bet is. We can't really see how deep they are behind. So maybe he didn't want to bet and, and face an all in or something like that. I mean, he kind of, he, he played his own style. He played very unique, right? I, I think uh, the way the game would be played now, he'd probably play these kind of hands differently. Right. Yeah, that's the, that's definitely the, the funniest thing to notice that this was played, you know, about 10 years ago or in, even longer in, in some cases. Uh, and the playing styles have just changed so much, you know, bet sizing, you know, the way people play position, the way people play post flop, especially. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to make a little bit of an assumption here, but I think we see more, you know, small bets these days and big bets these days. And back then there was also sort of that big middle ground. And I also think that back in the day there was a lot of three and four betting and that has a slow down a little bit from my perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of right. Like we see maybe more accurate theoretical sizings by players these days, but when you watch these live games, like live cash games, the people play kind of similar in some ways, right? There's, there's different players of all types of play style and like the super best players often aren't in these games that are using the exact GTO sizing and all this kind of thing like that. They don't leave the house sometimes. So they're not really on television or, on these live streams playing these games so you still see both types of styles where you see people go small bets and then you see people make these over bets and larger bets as well too so yeah i mean if you uh if you watch some of the other live games you probably find pretty similar if you watch some of the triton crazy stuff they got going on you you probably see <laughs> you know you probably see play looks very similar to this in a lot of ways yeah, that's a very good point. Obviously, you know, we are exposed much more to live tournaments than we are to live cash games. So uh, the Triton ones are definitely a great example of how, you know, you still have a lot of crazy plays. Um, funny question here from uh, Callum on YouTube. He says, Joey, what's the most times someone can run it? Is there, are there rules for this? Like, can you run it like an unlimited amount of times? I think if you're like a, a fun player who or an action seeker, right, who people are, are willing to give some some. Uh, they kind of let you do what you want to do. So like Bill Perkins might be in a game, right? He's a little crazy, creates a lot of action. If he said, I want to run the whole entire deck out, then I think the table would say, yes, sure. Why not? Maybe if you're in a home game, you see that sometimes where two players are messing around and they joke around and say, let's run the entire deck out too. I've seen that before happen, but for the most, usually three or four are the most. And then that's really the most I've seen is about four times. Right. And then just ask uh, Andrew Robel and Patrick Antonius about running it four times. That's a, that's a good story right there. If you want to Google that, it's a pretty fun one. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a classic, classic pot of my hand, right? I mean, that's like that hand is some people's only experience to the great call was watching that hand go down and saying, like, how is this possible? And, and the question remains. How is it possible? That's that was absolutely insane. All right. Dwan put in a squeeze. He put in a big raise. And then, of course, he got Eastgate to tag along with the Jacks. Um, seeing some opportunities here for Dwan with this uh, with this flop, at least given the fact that we know Eastgate's holding. Dwan always seemed to win these kind of hands, Remco. He always just seemed to make the right step, make the right move. I mean, <laughs> we very rarely saw him do something crazy when the other guy just happened to have a really big hand. Right. And the fact that he never, in this case, ran into, you know, a set of queens and blasted off or, you know, I don't know, even like, you know, I don't know, ace queen suited or, or a hand that could be in his range uh, that he doesn't have that because Dwan's going to fire a 62-2 anyway, it feels like. 
Yeah, I mean, we saw some of that on like uh, Poker After Dark. We might have seen it happen a few times, some of those Poker After Dark cash games. But on, I mean, this is obviously a very small sample size, right? And high stakes poker, it's only a few episodes where they really played. So we're not getting to see too many hands. So it could be the sample size where a lot of Helmuth play, right? It seemed like uh, he's always running super bad. Jean Robert Belande running super bad. So it's just our perception of a few small number of hands that we got to see. So we're basing like our entire histories of these players off of a few episodes that are edited down. So you right. never know what exactly we missed out on. But just think about how much Juan's status in the game, that he was owning everyone on this small sample size and, and crushing everyone. Compare that to if that would have been Peter Eastgate on you know the crushing side of things, how different that Dwan would have looked in the long term because his status was cemented on these games. They, it really was, right? I mean, he was battling a lot of the, the high stakes online, but high stakes poker was the popular show to watch at the time in terms of who the high stakes players were. So when he came on here and just happened to be making all the right plays against all these players who you thought were the top players at the time, like you just assume if you're playing in this game, you're a top player. Peter Eskate won the world. So people assumed he was the top player. And in retrospect, right, I guess he was playing on poker starts at the time too. So he was, he was known as a pretty good player as well. But it didn't, the stakes you play doesn't necessarily mean that you're a better player or not. It just means that you have more money sometimes or you have the right connections. So I think that people start to realize that a bit more over time. And, but at this time, we didn't necessarily know that. We just assumed if you're playing high stakes poker, you're the best players in the world and these are the guys to watch. Exactly. And, you know, there's some truth in that as well. But it just, you know, it, it, it's, it's the, the threshold that um, if you walk into Bellagio, you walk into, you know, the podium area, the biggest game you'll see there, it may be 5,100. And then in Bob's room, they're playing 4K, 8K. There's nothing in between. So, you know, to make that leap, there, there's so much needed. Um, any thoughts on why that gap is so massive and why there's nothing in between? Uh, it's a good question, right? May just probably just not a community of people who are right, want to start games like that. But I think what's online, we're seeing probably a bigger middle section. But where, like, where would where would those players come from? And they got to start the games. They got to build the community. They got to find the action players that want to play. They have to find the regulars who want to play too. So it takes a lot of work to get a game like that going in any community. So that's probably why we don't see that in between, like the the players who want to play higher stakes. So let me ask you this, Joey. What's the highest stakes you've ever played? How 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 sick was it? Uh, the highest stakes was in Bobby's room. I played in there. It was it was 200, 200 300 at the time. Ooh. And was that yeah. a P, was that a PLO game? Yeah, that was a Palomino Mall game. Yeah, that was like my first time really in Vegas when I was playing high stakes. So I went over there to play. Played some fifty hundred. I was doing well. Played a few rounds, and then I put my name on the room for Bobby's room just because I figured I might as well play if I'm here. Said so, I got called. I was so, super nervous. Sat down. Johnny Chan's in there. Brian Rast is in there. Uh, I'm, I'm just like shaking, kind of. Never played really that high stakes for live poker. And uh, I got a little needle from Brian Rast. He said you need to buy in for the the min buy-ins for uh, you couldn't buy in for 20k. You had to buy in for like 40k or something like that as the min. So yeah, I was kind of I was kind of nervous, man. It was it was right the high stakes regular professional telling you what to do telling you, you got to buy in for more money to get on the table i was like is that really the rule whatever i'll just do it the rules and so <laughs> but it was fun it was a lot of fun so, so just just imagine the Im intimidation fan rast who plays there every single day the new kid walks in and he immediately like tries to up the adrenaline a little bit by doubling the buy-in or at least you know m reminding you of the fact that there's a lot which is just a really funny thing to think about Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened, Remco. It was pretty it was pretty terrifying at the time because I didn't know any better at the time. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how live poker worked. Yeah, it was definitely strange. Um, if people are experiencing connection issues, please hold on. I think my internet had a little bit of a wiggle um, in and out, back and forth, but um, it looks as though we're still we're still running. So I'm not I'm not gonna panic, but we're just gonna keep rolling. Seeing Greenstein there with the Ace King, um, but yeah, please uh, bear with us here if there are some uh, connection issues on your end, uh, as far as from the viewer perspective. Um, if you have any questions for Joey, please send them in. We'll make sure to get to them. This show is live. We are on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel do all that good stuff and then we'll be able to provide you with as much of this content as we possibly can um back to this hand here um multiple or raise in multiple colors it was sort of the standard recipe for any hand in high stakes poker and then negranu you know throwing it in there with the king nine off um it, it's just all so loose before the flop it's just so awesome to see 
Yeah, there was a lot of action on these games. They were always really, really fun, really good. People were mixing up. I mean, Ellery was always mixing it up. Doyle was like much on the tighter side. Barry was on the tighter side as well, too. But Negranu, Ellie, Sammy, Tom Dwan, those guys loved playing hands. So it was so much fun to watch them play. Right. Greenside makes it a little over 100K, and that should get rid of all, all, the, all the interested people here on this hand. All right, moving into the next one. Um, yeah, so connection issues continue to uh, the Cox internet for uh, um, <laughs> messing, with, messing with my Thursday night over here. Um, but yeah, well, let, let's see if we can hold it steady here uh, to, uh, to continue to show, but it looks as though we're, we're back online, so that's good news. All right, anyway, um, Joey, so your first time in Vegas, or at least one of your first times in Vegas, you, you play in Bobby's room. Um, was that, on one side, a reminder of, like, this is where I want to be, this is where I you know, aspire to be in you know, for many years to come, or was it more so perhaps a realization of, like, hey, you know, I can make money doing, doing something against opponents that are not as good? Uh, I mean, it just wasn't very like a, a feasible thing to do because I was mainly an online player and I always knew I was going to go back outside the country. So the first time I could afford to play those high stakes, I knew I was going to go back to playing online poker. So I more did it for the novelty factor of it just to try it out and see. But I never really played live poker as a, as a series. I just never really, it never, never crossed my mind, even though the games are softer and the players are weaker. But I never really considered that that was my full-time thing. So I just didn't, did, it didn't even cross my mind that it was a possibility for me to do. I mean, that's, that's too bad. I mean, obviously, we would have loved to see you more in, in Bobby's Room types games. Um, do you think that that was the right decision back in the day, though? Because of how much softer the games were, you, you could have had a lot of success in, in, in high-stakes live games. Yeah, I just didn't really know how the live live poker world worked in terms of uh, finding people to sell action to or getting in softer games or up stakes, the players got better. But in reality, the regulars got worse and the fun players were just as bad, if not worse. So it really occurred to me at the time that that was how it worked. I just had no idea. You know what I mean? Like, right. you, you, no one, I just never, I didn't know any live players at the time when I knew played online poker. Right. All right. While we watch this hand, I'm just going to try to connect my, my Ethernet cable that I have laying around here. My Wi-Fi is always super strong, but I have to miss any of the action. So I'm going to turn out the audio here, Barry Joey, and have the audience uh, listen on this hand here. But Barry has the flush and a call. There's an eight on the turn. Barry checks. Looks like 45. Ellie's gonna follow through. Yeah, he bets forty-five thousand here. I don't know what Ellie's putting Barry on, but I know one thing: he wants Barry to throw away his hand. Ellie wants to take <laughs> the pot right here. Yeah. I think Barry might be figuring if it's worth it to call and draw to the flush. Barry raised wow. to 200,000. I didn't expect that at all. While Ellie was reading Barry, Barry was reading Ellie. Big move. Plus, Ellie's been on Barry about not gambling. Mm -hmm. Take that, Mr. Elezra. <laughs> 200,000 with six high. <laughs> Ellie was not expecting this. No way. He had the correct read on Barry. Yes, he had the correct read on Barry. Well, he connected, so let's just roll with that. Let's just keep the train going. Um, anyway, thank you guys all so much for watching. Uh, Joey, thanks so much for being with me here. Um, we got a lot more uh, hands to go through. I'm a little bit off my game because of all this internet bullshit, and I'm, and I'm not used to it. I'm used to everything going smooth. So let's just look at this hand and get, get back into the zone. And now, and now, jo and now Joey goes out. What's, <laughs> what's going on here? Unreal. Just messing with you, brother. Just messing with you. I, I appreciate it. All right. Making you think. Uh, top pair for Tom Dwan. That's like a top set. Predict call. Zygmunt's gonna call. Here you go. All right, here comes the five or the three. <laughs> I just feel it. You gotta get down there and play. Math again. is idiotic. Five or three. <laughs> Seven of diamonds on the turn. Well, I think Dwan's gonna bet here, and I think that's gonna be the end of the story. We took a shot, Zygmunt, but... What are you going to do? Dwan bets 28700 Maybe my guy's not going to give up here. 
He could be putting Juan on a 4-5 or East 5. Look at this. Or Juan might have absolute air. So he's giving me another shot to catch that 5 or 3 on the river. All right. Another diamond on the river. I don't think the diamond really mattered to either of these players. Are we back on here, Remco? We are. We're running smooth. All right, cool. We are running smooth. We've got Tom Don with top pair and Hillary with the good old three, which is a great great pair to call down Tom Dwan, which has worked in n almost no cases at all. Um, but yeah, we are we are smooth. We are steady. I think we've solved it. I think we're we're back. Perfect. Okay, we're back on. Yeah, my buddy. I I I thought I when I mentioned uh, my old roommate Z in the chat, I thought we were streaming, but I guess we weren't. So a big shout out to him. A lot of love to him, man. And uh, yeah, man, he was like the first, my first, one of my first po coaches, basically, who I used to watch him play heads up. And I didn't know what the hell was happening. And we would sometimes go to the casino together and go play at the casino together, play one two. Yeah, that was crazy. We're living in a very small apartment, four bedroom in Chicago, North Side, Lincoln Park. I lived in a closet. He lived in the back. It was a shitty fucking place at the time. And uh, I mean, I don't know, man. It was it was a very motivating place to be in because you're like, you can't get much worse than this, right? We moved out of our houses, out of the suburbs, or I moved out of my house out of the suburb. I'm living in a big city. I'm sleeping in a closet, right? And I got my computer set up on my bedroom floor with my air mattress. And I just was like, you know what? I'm going to grind this every day until I could run my bankroll up. And, um, you know, it kind of worked after a, after a lot of hard work. <laughs> I mean, t take, take me back to the old Chicago Joey, because, of course, you know, that's also where the name comes from, of course. Take me back to what the day-to-day -day was like back then did you go out and grab a bagel and some coffee and grind all day was it ordering pizza hut delivery and just you know we, no we, man yeah there, ever, there was you... like a mcdonald's down the street that was like 213 so we'd sometimes go down there get a get a double cheeseburger get a cup of water get a small french fry for dollars 13 cents there was uh, a bunch of little small places right around me where i lived in lincoln park it was clark and diversity right by the zoo right by the water there right by like the college life so i would just kind of go get fast food i didn't know how to cook at the time come back home, I either watch poker on television, post in the forums, talk to poker friends, or I was grinding poker every single day. I did that for, for months, basically. Wow. So what, there was no social life, no going out, no no using the spoils of your hard work for some bar tabs? Uh, well, I wasn't really making too much money at the time. I kept all my money online, and I'd only cash out money to pay my pay my bills that I had, or, or that's pretty much all I did. So I had friends. They all played poker. I had some like gym friends. I had some beach friends. And then I had some girls I, I kind of saw and dated off and on. So yeah, I mean, but it was, I was pretty focused on what I wanted to do, which was poker. So before that I was, I was big into working out. So I was always working out every day and I had my workout friends and we kind of just worked out, had fun, went out. But I took poker seriously because I, I, you know, I wanted to make something out of myself and make something out of my life that was a little bit more than what I was doing at the time. So was making something out of yourself the aspiration of making enough money was it the aspiration of wanting to be pro and live large in vegas or you know where you're thinking like maybe i'll make some money and do something else like did you have a, a goal and plan in mind no not really i just kind of wanted to not have to rely on my parents to pay my 281 a month rent and pay my eight dollar a month car insurance or film bill so i was just trying to find anything i could do at the time because there wasn't really youtube back then where you could learn anything like you can learn it now so I got lucky where I saw poker on television and I found the poker forums. I found a few poker friends on the two plus two poker forums at the time. And we just started playing together, talking poker, getting better. But yeah, I made a thousand dollars. And I was like, this is the most insane. I cannot believe you can make a thousand dollars from playing this fucking game. So yeah, after that, I just always aspire to play in high stakes and be on high stakes poker, or see my name as a team pro and stuff like that. So that, that was basically what I aspired to be like when I first started playing poker. All right, let's jump into this hand real quick here. We got Ellie with the queen 10 suited. We got a stand for Hillary and we got sevens for Dwan. This could, this could be something. Let's see. This could be, could be something. Look at Hillary. He looks so angry. He looks so miserable. All right, three way to the flop. He needs a drink probably. Yeah. You certainly might. There wasn't much drinking on this show. That's true. Shout out to Wiener Circle. Yeah, flop. Wiener Circle in Chicago Shit, on the north Ellie side. It's a uh, very late night place. Hand. It's a lot of people go there when they're really drunk and the, the, the staff like talk shit to you. I mean, it's a little interesting place. If if I was dealing with drunk drunk people in, in the middle of the night for my minimum wage job, I would talk shit too. Yeah, why not? 
This 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 board is a little bit like who wants it most, uh, given the hands that we see. That's twenty two thousand six hundred. And the one the one theme that we see on high stakes poker, at least these last couple of episodes, is that Hillary does not want to give up to Dwan. Not even not even an inch. He just doesn't want to give up at all. Well, these two were playing so much poker together online at the time that they had like a crazy dynamic. This might have been after the Dwan versus Sigmund heads up challenge went down as well, too. So, yeah, they those two had a rivalry. They were probably bluffing each other in crazy spots. And <laughs> Scruton says Tom Don is so cute in a nerdy <laughs> poker way. I mean, the Tom, the Tom Dwan face is, is, is one of my favorite looks. <laughs> So I'm saying he always ran well in these spots. They never made the top pair on the river. They didn't have the king, king, queen nope. there. Never had ace king. They always just had ace ten. Right. Um, now that I have you cornered here on this live show, uh, Joey, I want to bring up the list that I made: the top okay. ten most talented poker players in the world. I did okay. not. I did not put Zygmunt in my top ten. And my first question about this list is: Do you think he belongs as far as talent goes? Well, I guess I don't really know how you're qualifying talent, and right? So what's the, what's the qualification for that? The, the, the qualification for talent, from my perspective, is you invent a new poker game. Who's the best player after 24 hours? I mean, it sounds kind of kind of like a weird way to do it. I, that's not even a real possibility and doesn't make much sense because you can never know. And people are just going to speculate on the most... Right, like they're going to think about someone who's smart and who broke down a hand one time and maybe got better at a spot. So it's going to be super personal preference, of course. Sort of thing, and you know what I mean. It's like a, but it, but it's but it's that intuition that, that that poker wit that that you know just you know general smartness with cards and and games and we all know people like that that we grew up with that we're just better at these games because they picked it up so fast. So that's why it's probably the easiest way to summarize this criteria by sort of putting it like that. But obviously, talent is is a much wider scope. And I put Ivy at number one and Stu Unger at number two and Victor Blom at number three. And then Seaver said, you know, Victor Blom is obviously. Are going to be the number one and we got tons of responses and input but i, I really uh, thought that zygmunt was was one of the guys that belonged up there because he did not seem to me as a studier or a guy who really you know was going to put in all the hard work he seemed more like a guy who would just play and he was just you know doing it all on talent yeah it's interesting right i mean so we're considering if you do it all on talent you don't study that means you're talented I mean, it's not a it's not a negative thing to say. I just think that people have different styles and approaches as far as how they got to the top. And I think that right. you know someone like Zygmunt probably you know wasn't as much of a studier and, and a strategy talker. But that's from my perspective. I don't know if you can correct me. Then please go ahead. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting to think about because I'm sure like he had everyone has their group of friends they talk to a lot, which is one way that they get better. So it's just a big part of the learning process is to have other people that you speak to or coach or explain or type out your thought process. So it'd be very hard to get really good at a game just by thinking about it and playing it, which it's certainly possible. But I think a lot of players might underestimate how much they really talk to other players because that's a really big part of things. And so I would just imagine that he might not seem like the most social person at the poker table from the small sample size we've seen of him. But we obviously saw when he spoke online, he had a lot of shit to say and he was a big shit talker and he was always right. Like he, that's, that's kind of attitude he had. So I imagine like he had a very high self-confidence and high belief in his ability and belief in himself. And he probably worked at his game quite often too. So yeah, I think that might be just underestimating that a little bit, but obviously hard to know unless you ask the people or you talk to them. Right. So as far as from your perspective, um, do, do any players come to mind when you think of talent? Maybe people you've interacted with, people you talk to, maybe some of your friends where you're like, wow, that person is really sharp immediately on something, even though we're discussing a new concept. Yeah, I think I, I think I've just met a lot of really smart poker players. So it's hard to know, like, how how long would it take them to get really good at something? Because I know a lot of people who are already great at what they do. And I've seen people who've gotten better over time. So either way, I think it just takes time to the point where you become really good at whatever it is that you do. So just because you might be really good at something after 24 hours, somebody might spend seven days on it and they might be better than you if you only spend 24 hours on it. Of course. So yeah. I think Jason Kuhn said it, said it really well on one of your shows one time that like kind of the most talented player is whoever's focusing on that game at the moment amongst a group of players. And then if they're all focusing on there, then 
maybe it's just the one who, who's working a little bit harder at that time, that person becomes the best. Right. And you can, you can take talent also as, you know, discipline and, you know, the way you approach life and the way you approach the game. So there's definitely various different ways, but it's much more fun to, you know, turn it into a list and see how people feel about it. Because obviously the most, the, the, the thing that upsets someone the most, is if you put a list out there, that doesn't include the name of their favorite player. And, you know, that's definitely what this did. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, people, obviously we've seen in, in the sports media, they love debating these things that have no answer. So why not, why not debate it, right? Everyone's answer is going to be different. That's no one's wrong. No one's right. Unless we line up a game and we see people compete against each other. Right. So maybe we got to do that. Maybe we got to, maybe we got to line the event up and make that happen. I mean, all these guys are invited. I mean, that'd be, that'd be a fun, a fun conversation and a fun game to watch. Definitely. All right, here goes oh, Eastgate. What the hell is he doing? Eastgate the same thing that Barry does. Dole's probably got a weak jack. Wow. He's not sure what Barry has, but Barry just called and Barry might have a hand like a pair of tens. So Peter Eastgate thinks he could win it right here with that bet. And Barry doesn't like that bet. That's a pretty large raise. But he's not throwing ace jack away. Wow. So Dole bets 35k, Barry, Barry calls, and then Eastgate jammed or puts in 104k. Dole folds, Barry calls. Ten of spades on the turn. Wow. Damn. That gives them both flush draw. It's a horrible Peter great Eastgate card for Eastgate. Nut flush draw. He checks. Barry's got the nut flush draw. Even though Barry's got top pair. Yeah, I mean, once Barry here, calls here, you obviously know he's got an incredibly draw. strong hand, so. Seems like Barry doesn't want to see Yeah, this cards. seems very I wonder what Peter's going to do here once he turns that flush draw. If Barry wow. knew what Peter Eastgate had, I think he'd bet a little less. Yeah. Take a chance of maybe Peter catching a king or a seven because if a spade would come. So what do you think Barry's thinking that Peter can have here? Because his move in general looks extremely strong, betting into Doyle, who's been very tight on high stakes poker, and Barry's calling range versus Doyle's bet. And then keep in mind that Eastgate, you know, isn't known to be insane either. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, right? Once the guy checks there, if he had a set, he's probably just going to keep betting. So it looks like he just has something that isn't very strong, right? Maybe like a seven, seven, eight type hand. I mean, it's just such a very weird spot when you have ace jack there. Maybe he also has ace jack and he might fold ace jack too. There's always that possibility as well. Especially once Peter raises two of the really tight players in the game. Right. So I, I'm just curious, you know, if, if Barry should be more afraid of sets there and checking back a lot more because he has so much equity, already a made hand with the flush draw. But of course, you know, I don't think Eastgate's raising range on the flop there is going to include much more than, you know, you know, some funky combos, the one that he had, of course, but then a lot of sets and, and, and you know, worse jacks, I guess, or split pots, maybe ace jacks. Right, he maybe he might be thinking he's getting him off a split pot. There is some chance, like he check raised with like a two back doors type of hand, like a back door flush draw, back door straight draw. And maybe he picked up a pair on the turn, even though the turn was uh, was a spade, so he couldn't have had like a ten nine spades type hand. Yeah, just a, I mean, it makes sense where Peter's coming from. He thinks he's been playing pretty tight, and he's got a lot of fold equity. He does have uh, an over pair, an over card rather, with the king, and he's got the back door flush draw as well too. Makes sense where he's coming from, but just didn't work out. That's how it works sometimes, right? And Tom Dwan might pull off a check raise there, gets through, and sometimes your opponent has top pair, top kicker, or they have queens plus, and they don't fold. So, right. Exactly. Uh, for the people who are new to the show, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing some comments on both platforms about this show, this is Run It Back. We are live. If you have any questions, please send them in about the game, about the show, about Joey, about his life, about anything else that's going on. Please do let us know. Uh, we are watching Season 5 of High Stakes Poker. Uh, this is Episode 6. If you want to just watch this on PokerGo without us talking over it, that is very much a possibility as well. All seven seasons are available on PokerGo. And Season 8 will be coming to PokerGo in the near future. We are hoping that, you know, COVID things, if everything is well, we can tape a show with some of your favorite players. So do let us know in the chat who your favorite players are. And uh, if you want to see him on High Stakes Poker, we're going to try to do our best. Um, you know, Joey, if, if High Stakes Poker ever becomes PLO, you know, there's going to be a GoFundMe. You're going to get in that game. That's how it's going to work, right? Uh, it just depends how I'm doing in my life with my business. So my business is going well and I'm doing well at poker. I feel confident. I'll definitely play, right? If there's there a PLO, high right. stakes poker in the future, and I'm in a position where uh, I'm doing well, then I'll, I'll definitely play. All right, Why would I not? It'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be, yeah, it'd be epic. It'd be epic. Big, big. Plus, I'm sure it'd be a softer game, too. So there'd be some players on there that are splashing around. Exactly. Big, big hand here. 
We got straddle from Tom Dwan to four to to four K. Benjamin raises to twenty K with the nines. Hillary calls, Daniel calls, and then Greenstein puts in hundred and seventy five K with Ace King. <laughs> These re raises are always so huge, man. I mean, what else are you gonna make it? I mean, no one ever folds to, to raise to seventy K, it seems. Right, I mean I guess you can't make it that small. And I'm sure Zygmunt and Daniel are gonna be gone too. That's it. I mean, look how look how much you take down pre flop without a flop. Maybe you want maybe that's what you want, right? I mean, it's so crazy. <laughs> the, these plots are so big. Uh, Dragon is asking on YouTube, uh, Joey, are you still crushing PLO? That's the big question. Uh, I've been playing a little bit more lately. It's been going pretty well. Kind of with PLO, you have some big winning sessions, big losing sessions. It's uh, it's been more winning sessions than losing sessions for me too. But I'm also working on a few other things in my life as well. So. In the past, I just played poker every single day, and that was the only way I structured my business in the entire world. And everything lived and died by how much I was making or losing at the poker tables. And now I'm trying to structure my business a little bit differently in terms of how I use my skills and how I make money and the people that I work with. So I think poker is just like a very isolating thing to do for a living the way I did it. And in retrospect, I would have liked to have more of a, of a team vibe and more people that were better around me to, to be my support system in place when I would lose my mind or when I would just be playing for long sessions and just need a break from it. So I think a lot of the ways that people play professional poker is kind of unhealthy. And that's what leads to a lot of professionals getting burnt out a little bit and they just might need a break or need to retool their approach in the system that they used to play. But I think I'd like to just have poker be something that I go in part-time to sometimes full-time occasionally, but more of like a part-time thing until I get my other business is kind of set up in place in terms of how I want to make my money and my investments right. And then from there, I'll be able to play more or I'll find some soft games once in a while and play in those a lot. So there's a lot of different ways that you can approach it these days that, uh, I mean, make it kind of exciting to figure out. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, on Twitter, you're always very vocal about being interested in a plethora of different things. You're always, you know, studying and soaking up information, you know, whether it is in the content space or elsewhere. Um, and that sometimes makes me wonder, like, why don't you just... Tell yourself, like, okay, I'm done with the playing aspect of poker, and I'm going to actually, for maybe a, a month or two months or six or six months or a year, dedicate myself to one of these specific outlets to see how far I can take that. Because you've already proven in poker, both as a player and as a creator, that you can do it. So why not go, you know, headfirst into something else? Because that's what ultimately got you to where you are now in the game of poker. Yeah, that's something. I mean, I'm thinking about right now, Remco. It's a really good point, right? I think that for me, and whenever I've made poker content for the past six, seven years, I always played poker. So it just made it more fun, more exciting, more relatable, more understandable when I would talk to other great players. And I think lately, a lot of my study has been more on the business side, on the marketing side, on the content side, on the dealing with people side of, of the world, which aren't necessarily as relevant for high level poker strategy or winning in poker games. But yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's something I'm weighing right now and, and something obviously I know to have the most success you can have. It's something you have to go all in with it and focus on that 100%. Right. So I'm aware of that. And that's something that I'm really trying to figure out if that's what I want to do. If that's how, if that's the bar that I want to set for the, the goals I have for myself. Right. So is it just a matter of interest level where like there's nothing in the world that tickles you as much as poker still does? Yeah, man, that's real interesting. I think that poker is one of the best uh, learning grounds for a lot of the ideas that I have with content and what I think would work and what people would like and what people would get excited about and what people would watch. And there's also just a lot of issues happening in the industry that I think that I can do a pretty good job of helping out. So there's a lot of different reasons why I want to stay around. And also I help my friends out who are trying to start poker projects as well, too. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pros out of it, and there's not a ton of cons because there's always going to be the rest of the world out there for me to explore if I want to go head first into that. So I'd like to stick around poker for a little while and uh, see what I can do with some of my ideas. I mean, we're glad to have you. I'm not trying to get you out of the game. I mean, obviously. Yeah, but no, I mean, you know me a little bit better than most people, so it's a pretty fair question to kind of ask. Right, and I, and I think that for someone who has been able to build up a personal brand in the way that you have. And, you know, we can speak for Doug as well, who's done it on YouTube as well. And then he pivoted out of poker completely. And he's and he's done well in, in like the real world, so to say. So th there should be a lot of potential there as well for you because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, 
Poker is just poker. The real world is far bigger than that. You know, I think someone like Bill Perkins has, has spoken on that a lot of the times that, you know, poker is, is, is the best hobby in the world and it's the, the coolest thing to play as, as, your, as your fun thing to do. But then when it comes down to it, you know, the game itself, as you also said, you know, can, can sometimes just have, you know, lots of ups and downs and be very, very tough on your mind. And you got to step away sometimes and it can really drag you. So I'm just curious to see where you'll, where you'll go, Joey. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're very right. Like poker essentially is a business and you're a businessman when you're playing poker, whether you put a lot of effort into that business or not is up to you. And a lot of people don't and they don't treat it that way. But once you realize like poker is a business and you study business and understand how business and finance and accounting and how these things work, you start to understand, well, what are my strengths? My strengths are maybe building a brand or being consistent or knowing a lot of people or being good at marketing or being good at creating content. And you start to realize, well, you can you can do a lot of things with that. You could either be a service to other companies or other people who want to get better at those things, or you can potentially create your own product in any genre and you understand how to market and you understand how to get it in front of the people who are the possible consumers on the different platforms. And you understand influencer marketing and you understand investing in, in talent and investing in content. So once you start realizing like how you got good at something, you start to understand that you can reframe that in many different industries so poker is one, it's a very challenging one because it's not regulated and it's kind of wild, wild west. So the, the best kind of business you can build theoretically from a monetary perspective is an operator and the operator are limited, which is why the application sites are so popular because people can play on those application based sites and they can start their own games and be the operator and take the rake and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things you kind of got to figure out in poker if you want to make a business is well, what, how much do you want to work? What do you want to do? How much do you want to make? Who do you want to partner with, right? All those things really matter. So I'm just kind of taking my time to decide if poker is the place for me. If not, then I'll find someone else. But why not? I think it's a lot of fun, and we got a legendary hand right here. So I, I was going to say, you know, I wanted to sort of let you, you know, get your story done there because this is this is one of the hands. If if we're doing a top ten uh, hands of all time. I think this is one of them that belongs in there. Let's take it from the top here. Eastgate, 3.5K. Barry Greenstein, 15K with aces. There's Tom Dwan. King-Queen suited. One of the prettiest hands in the deck, if you ask me. Um, I mean, I want to say, let's see where this goes. We all know where this goes, but let's just see where it goes because that's the beauty of this hand is that no matter how many times you see it, it's exciting every single time. So I'm not even going to speculate. Let's just watch. Every season he won, every kid getting one. He's a good player, the best player, buddy. All right, he's going to call. Peter Eastgate might raise. He might think Ace King's the best hand here. I mean, that's a side angle that we hadn't considered yet, that this could have ended up being an all in between Eastgate and Greenstein. Yeah, very easily. Now he's just going to call. Queen, four, deuce, two spades. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what is it that uh, Francis Scott Key said when he was in the... Uh, Speaking uh, of, the perfect Harper. flop. Bombs bursting in air. The rockets, red glare. That's what <laughs> we're going to see here in this hand. Tom Dwan's got top pair and a flush draw. Barry's got aces. And when the hand is over, let's see who remains at <laughs> the dawn's early light. <laughs> Dwan starts out with a $28,700 bet. Peter Eastgate's missed the flop. I don't see him calling here. And Barry raises to 100,000. He's not going to slow play. Raising with four chips, making it 100K, is definitely some kind of statement. He hopes Tom Dwan has a queen. He doesn't want Dwan to have a queen and a flush draw, no. which is what he has. <laughs> Dwan is probably thinking, well, I can't be an underdog even if Barry has an overpair. Actually, Dwan would prefer Barry has aces instead of kings. But whatever Barry has, Tom Juan's got to go with this hand. Here he comes. Wow, he's going to raise to 244,600. 
Barry says okay. He's gonna put Dwan all oh, in. Oh man. <laughs> Barry's hoping that Dwan has the kind of hand he has and not a set of deuces or a set of fours. Uh, let's look at the percentages here for the people watching at home. 50 50. Just a million dollar coin flip. Oh, I figured. That's what I figured you had. I guess I could have taken the card off. Let me take those back. I think so, right? Whatever you want, I don't care. Right. Bombs, bombs, whatever. She said, Are we running at once? I think so, right? Uh, yeah, I want, to, wait, I want to run at once. If you wanted to take a couple hundred back, that's no. okay. Sorry. Okay. Twenty. That is the most gangster thing Tom Dwan has ever said in his whole career. Like he's 23 years old when this happened. In case you didn't hear what he just said, Barry said, "Yeah, once is good with me." And then he just sort of mumbles, "But we can take a couple hundred back." And he's like, "No, I'm good. I'm just totally good with that. Just let's just let's just run it. Let's just go, Barry." Two-year-old Tom Dwan says, "No deal. Once. Let's play cards." Another queen. Oh, wow. Barry's dead to the case ace. Tom Juan wouldn't take 200,000 back. Unbelievable. You don't want to do what I want to do, run it twice. I'm not going to do what you want to do. No case okay. ace. Tom Juan mm -hmm. has just won the biggest hand in the history of televised poker. Over $900,000 in a hand 100, with no 80, deal. Barry, Barry looks like he wants to, wants to jump off the bridge right now, Remco. I mean, that's a huge pot in this game, that deep, aces. To the young gun, you're the older guy. I think we talked about this maybe on one of my podcasts. Like this was a pretty big uh, moment of his life. Right. I mean, wow. I got I got to have Barry on the show one day to you know discuss all seven That's seasons. Painful. I mean, all seven seasons he played every single season of high stakes poker. He was always running at once. Um, and a few episodes ago, they ran at once as well, and Barry spiked a turn. This pot was a little bigger. And now Dwan spikes it for almost a million dollars. Whew. Just, God, it makes me feel sick. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a disgusting hand. I mean, that, that much money, a million dollars, that deep stacked. You get aces versus the kid, right? I, I think about that. You finally get aces against this guy. You get all in. He's got top pair in the flush draw. Immediately binge tri trip queens on you. And you're just like, how can this guy run so damn good against me? Like, how can I not? Like, you know what I mean? I'm sure these two have played so many huge pots against each other as well. At this point, like they probably had a very sick dynamic. So you can see Barry. He's just looking. <laughs> this looks like father son over here sitting there uh, talking to the school teacher about there, his. He's just always like so casually, like whatever. I mean, yeah, he's. I mean. Uh, shout out to Landon Tice in the chat on YouTube. He says, my man, Tom, exactly. We made the comparison last week. Landon was on the show. We had a lot of fun. Thanks, by the way, Landon, for tuning in. Uh, yeah, you're, 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 you're idol, the, the guy you're aspiring to be like, uh, I guess, as far as uh, bankroll. Um, a shout out as well to Ty Shiska Weber on Facebook, sending, sending 69 stars. Nice. Really appreciate Thank that. You. That is awesome. Really appreciate that donation there. Um, and then also Stephen Roach just sending 100 stars on Facebook. Appreciate that as well. That is awesome. Reza says, Dwan, please win. Reza, I'm glad you got to experience that because he did indeed spike the queen on the turn. Um, that was just, oh, man, that, that hand is like insane. I can, I can watch it over and over again. It's just brutal. Yeah, it's such a sick hand. I mean, those, those two played a few pretty epic hands against each other. It's crazy how epic these hands are. You know, it's funny. If Landon got a chance to play, I'm sure, on some high-stakes televised games, you'd probably see this kid make some... Uh, You'd probably see this kid make some very, very, very aggressive moves, very some very big bluffs and some very big calls because the man, uh, yeah, the guy doesn't like to fold. So he doesn't like to fold. He runs really well. He runs like God. And yeah, it'd be a show. I'm telling you right now. We got to get him on high stakes poker. I'd love to see him on there. Exactly. That'd be awesome. Well, Landon, just you know, keep sharpening those pencils and keep winning money because you got some time to uh, get the bankroll together to play on high stakes poker. We talked about it last week. He said, I think he said he needed a... Uh, you know, to put down maybe 40k of, of his own money and then maybe sell some pieces. But uh, yeah, we'll, 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 it would be awesome if he managed to become the new Tom Dwan because part of being Tom Dwan is running really hot in televised cash games. So we'll see if he can uh, pull that off. Let's see if Derek can pull this hand off here. I mean, anyone can do it. It's Derek. Maybe he <laughs> wins this one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is kind of those hands where it's about who wants it more. I mean, in this case, Negrano just goes for it. Yeah, he's at the double gutter. Dura's going to need to have a pretty strong hand to continue here. Yeah, like a 100 total. 
And of course, <laughs> wow. Wow. Wow, Ziggy Something went all in. Twice. Daniel called immediately. What do you have? Huh? What's the difference? <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? I'll do it twice either way. I have five, seven. You do you really? <laughs> just just chop it now then. No, no, I don't, we can't chop it now because I got a flush draw too. <laughs> I have five, seven also. I have flush draw too. <laughs> you have a flush draw? Uh -huh. I have flash trap too. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys right. chopping or you want to play for it? You want to chop it or you want to play for it? Okay, let's chop it. Let's chop just it. chop it. It's no a free problem. roll anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sick, he had the exact same hand. Can we, can, we can we rabbit hunt, please? What do you have? You thought maybe I had five, six? Yeah. <laughs> I think someone said, why did uh, Taj Curl Carol in the chat said, Duan putting 15K in their pre-flop. I'd like to hear Joey's thoughts on this. I think that Tom was just running really hot and uh, he was up a lot of money and he said, why not call? <laughs> That's what he, did. He, he would make plays like that sometimes where he would just call with a really marginal hand in a very marginal spot. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it seemed like a play. I mean, does he still make plays like that, Remco, you think? Or do you think that that play might have been something you do when you're 23 and you're up millions of dollars and uh, maybe you're on television and you're trying to put on a show a little bit? Or do you, do you think that he maybe doesn't do that kind of, those kind of plays anymore? I have, I have strong thoughts on this. I think that Tom Dwan created an image for himself that a lot of the rich, fun players that saw him play back in those days got so enamored with that the expectation became that whenever Tom Dwan was in their game, he was going to splash around like that as well. So he almost pigeonholed himself into playing a style in which he had to be loose and aggressive and go nuts and play for stacks all the time because that was the reputation that people were sort of playing for him with. Like he was the, he was the entertainment of the night when he sat down in some of these games. So I think that this is just who Tom Dwan is by default because of high stakes poker. So you think that Tom Dwan built this this style that he made i think he probably just thought these guys were bad in some ways too and he thought he had an edge post flop against them but you think that because he did that then the fun player action seekers their expectations of tom duan when he joined their game was he was going to play that way and then if he didn't play that way they might be upset so he felt obligated to have to satisfy his customers with this sort of crazy style that he then probably still plays to this day not necessarily by choice but because he, he wanted to put on a show for these people who are his customers. I, I, think, I think this goes both ways. I think he still has the massive advantage playing that style against those players because they are still playing against him. Like, oh my God, I'm playing against Tom Dwan. I'm going to do something crazy myself as well. Wow. So I think it is to his benefit, the fact mm -hmm. that he plays like this. But I also think that, you know... There, there is maybe, you know, and I, we know that Tom Dwan has access to some of the best games in the world. And I also know that if you come in there to sit back, relax, wait for Ace King suited, and then just rake in the money and take the next train home, that's not really going to fly for years on end. So I don't know. There's probably some middle ground. I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but wouldn't, it wouldn't be fun if I was trying to be realistic here. But let's just say that that's real possibility, right, Joey? Or am I completely out of line here? No, I mean, I think, I think you're pretty right. And also, he probably plays in games where everyone plays these crazy hands. So theoretically, he should have more experience yes. playing these uncomfortable preflop hands that other people would get in a lot of trouble with. But at the same time, your variance is going to ramp up extremely high when you're calling three bets with 9-5 suited. So even though you might be able to outmaneuver your opponents and have an edge post slop against them with bad hands, you're just going to run into it too often. So when you play these marginal hand preflop, you, you're going to find yourself in a lot of bad spots. And if you run bad, you're going to lose a lot of money. Right. So I imagine that this has brought him on many, many downswings over his career. And he's also brought him on some massive upswings. So it kind of depends on, right, maybe you can balance that style well and you can turn up the heat and you can make these splashy plays and you can give off a loose image when you need to. But uh, I mean, it's the cost of, yeah. cost of opportunity almost. This is a big one too, by the way. Yeah, I mean, this is such a sick turn card right here. You win. I mean, Daniel ran so bad on these shows. It's just... Yeah, it's nuts. That hand, like, sums it up, right? The guy called right. the jack six turns a six. I, I, that that's, sums up Daniel's run on high stakes poker. He ran so bad. Yeah, and that's it for him. He's walking off. Um, whew, let, me, let, me, let me put a hypothetical to you, Joey. If Tom Dwan had gotten crushed the way Daniel got crushed on high stakes poker... Would that have altered his career? Uh, I think it would have altered the perception. I mean, we always think of Daniel Negreanu as, as one of the top tournament players of all time, and we don't necessarily rate his cash game skills maybe that high, but I think it's just because he lost on these shows, and he was probably 
equally as great at a strategy at, at hold them at, at hold them cash games in some ways, but it's just hard to really know. So it's like, what are you really basing his play off of? All you can base it off of is the results. And if you see the guy run bad and walking out the door, losing money a few times, then yeah, in your mind, you just think, oh, this guy's like a losing player. When in reality, he did run pretty shitty on these shows. Right. Uh, Matthew on, fa- on Facebook, thanks so much for the shout. I'm glad you're enjoying the conversation. Um, lots of names in there that I'd love to shout out. Anoka, James, um, Luke, Johnny, Reza, uh, Lots of people with us still. I really appreciate you guys. If you guys have any questions, please let us know. Taj Carroll is saying, this is from about 15 years ago. Um, it is probably from 2009, right after Peter Eastgate won the main event. So we are reviewing some old footage of High Stakes Poker, but you know the fun's not going to be any less because this is some stuff that most of you guys at home, and, and at least for myself, I haven't seen in a very long time. So it is awesome to go through that. And we have you know quite a few more hands left to be played, so don't go anywhere. And please, if you enjoy this content, only and only if you enjoy if you don't like it you know it's fine too but if you enjoy it please hit the like button it really means a lot mm-hmm. and subscribe to the channel do all that good stuff it really is helpful um coming up on run it back next week we have reiner kempe breaking down to 2016 super high roller bowl final table that he managed to win that's going to be a long show there's a lot of hands that were played helmuth was in the game there Fe- that's the a- iconic moment where fader holds and phil helmuth shake hands and Fedor says, hi, Phil, my name is Fedor. And then they shake hands and Phil <laughs> says, hi, my name is Phil. Just one of my favorite moments uh, <laughs> in, in tournament history. And then next week on Thursday, we're going to have more high-stakes poker breakdowns. We'll continue season five. So if you're enjoying season five, we're going to watch some more of that. All right, Benjamin, pocket nines, making it 16K after uh, Duan had called, um, I believe, the straddle with ace three suited. Um, we got three-way action again, 50K in the middle. 50K in the middle doesn't even sound like a lot when you're watching this game. I don't owe you anything. Now, after you see I like a million dollar pot, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Nothing from you. Yeah, yeah. None from you. We just okay. changed the uh, bell Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I don't owe you anything. I'm, I'm, he's I'm on eight times. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till after the pot. Wait till after the pot. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I know. I know. I don't owe you anything. <laughs> it's weird that I wouldn't have it in my phone, so you might not. I don't know. No, no, we are even. I just took oh, from yeah, Barry. Yeah, I just guaranteed the money to Barry. Okay, yeah. We are even. Well, there. Hold on. Let me also say this for the people who are wondering what the hell is going on. Clearly, you know, someone had given Ilari the cash to sit down in this game because he's from Finland. He travels all over the world to sit down. The money has to come from somewhere. But who paid for it? Paid for it? Who vouched for it? Who made the note in their phone? You know, Joey, how much money has gotten lost over the years between these interactions that weren't written down or someone forgot who gave the money to who and, and like all that sort of stuff? Mill- millions of dollars. <laughs> this happens all the time where people, it's very casual. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense if you're not used to it, but it's very casual when you play a lot of these games with players regularly. People borrow money, $1,000, 10000 50000 And normally the big markers, people are going to be on top of, but you find some players who are quite aloof when they do this and they don't track their stuff properly. They might not remember. And it seems like Tom Duan is maybe one of those people who was a little bit more aloof with some of the figures that he was owed. And he had a lot of money. He was young. He didn't take it very seriously. So I would imagine he had a lot of money lost in translation, uh, possibly, right, in his career. It's so crazy. I think you're right. How yeah, much did I give you? 400? Yeah. See, he's like, how, how much, much did I give, I give you? 400? <laughs> like, we're not talking dollars, guys. We're not talking $400. 200? Do they know 400? I, I don't know. <laughs> this is incredible. That seems about right, because I think I brought about 1.2. Since what? we left Doyle, there was a lot of fireworks. He says, I think that's right. I brought about 1.2. Just 23-year-old kid. Totally. Landon, are you watching? Are you paying attention? Mm-hmm. This is definitely going to be Landon when it's he's about 23, too. It's battle, the Durstein War. <laughs> 925. And now Benjamin bets 38,000. There's a mystique about David Benjamin that people do not want to be bluffed by him. <laughs> David has played very solid, and Peter Eastgate calls rather quickly here. 38,000 with a pair of nines. Now the eight on the river. That eight. Benjamin had quads a few episodes ago, and Daniel gave him all his money. I don't know what it is about Benjamin, but people just don't want to... Don't I think he, he had a really he had a really rep, really good uh, aggressive reputation back in this time too. He'd go on a lot of swings that are very high online, and he'd be playing a lot of hands as well too. Plus, he's French, so maybe there's just something about French people that like to play a lot of hands. 
I don't think of French people as very tight myself, but maybe you do, Remco. I don't know. The French are loose. That's that's what I've been ta- taught. That's what I'm saying, right? The guy's yeah. accent, he starts talking. You just assume that this guy's a little bit more out of line than maybe he normally is. It's a, it's a very fair point. When I first played poker in France, that was the game. Raise and seven callers. Let, let's see a flop. Let's go. You play you played a lot of poker in France before? Not a lot, but when I traveled the tour, um, I went to the Unibit Open quite a few times back in the south of France in Nice, and I dabbled in some cash games there. You know, I'm 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 a I'm I'm a bum. You know, I play one one two, uh, but still one two euro can get out of hand. And I don't think uh, that's I don't think that's being a bum. I don't know. I'm always like, uh, yeah, Eastgate. <laughs> the time he decides to call down, he gets he gets uh, he sees the full house. Of course. Uh, for the people that are watching, and we have quite a few, uh, do let, let us know where you're watching from. Um, I believe last week we had the most international crowd I've ever seen. I think we were at, at every single continent represented except for Antarctica, and we had um, lots of different states represented as well. So I'm kind of curious if we're if we're up there again on the late night show here, because I know for many people around the world, this is not the time to be awake. So uh, let's see if we have any international viewership today on the show. I really would much appreciate it if you guys let us know where you're watching from. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to hit that like button. Um, Doyle Brunson, by the way, uh, Joey, when he plays in high stakes poker or poker after dark, he just sits there, he's tight. And whenever he gets a hand, he gets paid. Do you think that's how he made his bread and butter through the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s? Or do you think this is just, you know, old Doyle and he slowed down a little bit? I has, I've always wondered that too, right? I just assume that he's probably played similar to Barry where he was very tight but very aggressive when he came in. I think we just saw him happen to play pretty tight on these shows. So, I, yeah, I imagine he wasn't that tight. Maybe he was. I, I, I just I find it hard to believe he's that tight. But right. you can see the countries coming in. There are people from all over the place. There, Turkey. There we go. We got Johnny. Antarctica out there. I mean, there's two people from oh. Antarctica, allegedly. I don't believe that. Australia, Brazil, Chile. Saudi Arabia, Canada, New Zealand. Uh, one of our moderators saying, free, years, free year of Poker Go if you're actually watching from Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> if you send us proof that you're watching from Antarctica, then you get a free year of Poker Go. Uh, Johnny Ryan sent 200 stars on Facebook. Really appreciate it, Johnny. Where are you watching from? Do let us know. We've got Louisiana, Minneapolis, East Texas, Arizona, Brazil, vamos! In on Facebook. I really love seeing all the different countries out there. And there's one person that said, can you guys shut up, please? No, that's the whole purpose of the show. We won't shut up. If you want to watch this action without us talking, Go to Poker Go right now. Watch all all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker. All right, Elia Lezra, Peter Eastgate. Um, they got some action cooking here. Shout out to Tron the Wagon. He says, watching from Norway. Big fan of Joey. Three twenty a.m. There. Wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah, how's Norway right now with all the? Uh oh, look at this. Ellie thinks he got real lucky. Wow. Peter Eastgate is poker hard right now. Remco, the guy <laughs> leads into you. You got six four. <laughs> and it's funny that like. Eastgate is probably wondering, like, what could, what could Ellie even have? But it doesn't matter. I have a boat. Yeah, he's just confused. He's looking at his hand to make sure it's right. 188700 bucks. And Peter Eastgate looked at Ellie. It was a very good look right after he bet the money. Like really a six spot call. for Ellie Elezra. Wow. Can we get rid of the straight here, Joey? Is that even a possibility? I mean, I don't know. This is, uh, what would this guy ever be raising you with here, right? <laughs> he's basically telling you he's got a full house. Like, what is he bluffing you here with? You might think it's too strong to fold, but. Hope that Peter Eastgate's making a move. Would the guy do this with just three sixes for value? Like Maybe. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, this is tough. I can't see many hands that Eastgate would shove here. that'll do it not the news you want to see remco this this is one of the sort of i don't know most under the radar massive pots on high stakes poker i did not remember this at all eastgate winning a 400k pot in my memory he was just losing and losing and losing but i guess that's because Dwan kept putting him in the blender and now he takes some money from Elezra. Uh, shout out by the way to all the people watching from all over the world we got nepal in the house from lekhan subedi 
I appreciate you watching. Oh. We got uh, Kentucky in the house, Daniel Murphy. I think Daniel watches all the time. I appreciate that. Robert is saying, watching from Macedonia. Speak if you know where it is. Well, I know the capital is Skopje, so I definitely know where that is. I'm European. I'm from the Netherlands. I know where every place is. Iceland in the house. Um, we got Aust Australia. I appreciate that. It's early in the morning. It's coffee time in Australia, 10 a.m. probably somewhere in that part of town. Um, we got Matthew from Texas in the house as well. Um, international crowd once again. I appreciate it. Romans is saying, Eastgate quit poker. Yes, he did. I texted him a couple of weeks ago because I wanted to watch the 08 main event final table with him. And he said, sorry, I've talked about it too many times. I'm, I'm over it. I'm out. So uh, no Eastgate on this show. However, I texted Jerry Yang. We might have Jerry Yang on the show to watch the 07 yeah, what final. Jer what did Jerry Yang say? He hasn't responded yet. So I'm about to follow up and see if we I can I love that uh, guy, man. That guy's a legend, the legend of the World Series of Poker. Exactly. We got Korea in the house. We got Croatia in the house. So many countries in the house. All right. We got also got some some cards here in the house. We got we got we got some room to grow here for Elezra with a specific kind of turn card. <laughs> That's not it. You stole it. Stole it, yes. <laughs> Andre Agu Aguilar, Leon, Mexico, baby. Shout out to Mexico out there in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah, it really is diverse crowd watching around here, Emco. I appreciate it. And and also to uh, to your friend from Norway, um, from Trond. He's a big fan of yours. Tron, I hope you, you can become a fan of mine. Subscribe to the channel twice a week. Run, run it back. We're live. We've got all the biggest names in the game. Of course, none, mm -hmm. none bigger than Joe Ingram himself, but um, mm -hmm. appreciate you guys all joining me for this show today. Yeah, I think, I think the show's great because you get to see, you get to hear from a lot of people that you haven't heard from in a long time, which I think is really cool. You know what I mean? Like you get people that, that they don't do, like they might not want to do an interview, but they'll want to watch some, some high stakes poker, especially a show that they played on. Yeah, and the coolest part was having, you know, Greg Raymer and Chris Moneymaker and Joe Hashem relive their final tables from back in the day and really, you know, hear their stories from what that was like. And, you know, that's such a long time ago. It's awesome that we sort of documented their stories uh, from, from, those, uh, from those years. Um, Dwan, by the way, has zero credibility in this game, and Ellie does not want to ever fold against him. But, you know, <laughs> there's not much to gain in this spot. And he does give him. You guys have a two pair with the king, right? It is. It should 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 be a good hand. I get beats all the bluffs. <laughs> all right, Fernando has breached the subject on Facebook, Joey. Um, who you got, Negrano or Polk? This is something that's been out there in the world. Um, I think this conversation will pick up again when Daniel's back in the U.S. and and online is calming down a little bit. Uh, but there is a proposed. Um, heads up type grudge, grudge match that, that may or may not happen in the near future. Um, give me your thoughts on it. Yeah, I think that I'm going to go with, uh, with Doug on this situation just because it seems like he's going to have a little more preparation. Although Daniel's playing a lot of poker on GG. He's also playing the tournament format. He's playing different games. Uh, I know he's going to have some good trainers and good resources he's using to better his game. I know he's going to put up a good talk. He's going to put up a – he's underdog, right? You know, you can't deny that. He doesn't deny that. Doug has been playing a lot. He's studying. He said he wants to back up the truck, right? He's coming to back the truck up against uh, against Daniel. So I would just say that Doug's the favorite. Upsets do happen, but I think Daniel's going to need to get off to a hot start. But he's going to be fresh. He's going to be playing. He's going to be in the groove. Anything's possible, Remco. What do you think? Well, what I'm mostly curious about is, is this once and for all, no matter who wins, going to put the bet this sort of, you know, Online, yeah, I don't know, online man. Animosity. I mean, I thought, I thought that at the time, like when I was proposing the challenge and these two play, but maybe they don't. Maybe something said during it. Maybe not. I wish they would. I wish they'd both get over it, right? I want to go back to, you know, being a fan of both of these guys. I've always been friends with Doug, so I, I'm on I'm on Doug's side. I support Doug, but we're going to see what happens, right? I, I hope it goes the way. I hope it stops. I hope they stop talking shit to each other. But people find it so entertaining from like a media perspective and a content perspective that... You know, the, the fans get a little thing, get something to be excited about, too, which is cool. Exactly. Um, let us know in the chat <laughs> which side are you on, Team Doug or Team Daniel. Um, that heads-up match is obviously going to be a lot of fun to watch. As we are jumping into a new lineup, Joey, we're switching it up. We're, we got we got one more episode left here. We got a new lineup. We see Phil Locke, Patrick Antonius, Antonio Esfandiari. I love America, Mr. America himself. Look at that. Oh, oh, Howard. Howard. He's, he's, he's not very well-liked. Oh, boy. We got Joe Hashem in the house, which is awesome. We, we got um, uh, Sam Simon. We got Sam Simon, RIP, um, with us here in the, in the, at the table. And Nick Cassavetes. Uh, Negrano is back. So Nick, Nick Cassavetes is a famous... Uh, 
video film producer. He lives in LA, played a lot in the home games. Antonio was like peak Antonio right now, that big watch. Look at that watch, Ooh, Remco. Wow. That is the biggest watch face I've ever seen in my entire life. That's just insane. We had Patrick. He never said much. He always seemed to wear a button-up shirt. Phil Locke, the, the classic character in his hoodie, the Mr. Unabomber. Sam Simon, who I've never actually seen. Uh, I don't remember any hands he played on the show. And then uh, we had Howard Letterer, who at the time, what do we know him as? He was just like a guy who was on World Series Poker once in a while. Well, he I don't was... think I really associated him a ton with Full Tilt Poker. I really didn't even know he was involved with Full Tilt Poker that much until the whole entire situation went down. But well, I just always remember him from the ESPN shows, and he was always like a part of the crew. So I just he... didn't know, but I didn't know a ton about him at the time. He was always in all the commercials of Full Tilt, Team Full Tilt, and he was known as The Professor. That was like his, his nickname. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that now. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, Howard back then still had a great reputation. You know, we're, we're long past that station um, with that enormous Full Tilt Poker uh, screw-up that he's never... Um, he's never apologized for, I believe, and never really made up for either. So uh, poker stars build him out, and uh, then he all of a sudden showed up, showed up back at the World Series of Poker. But please stay home, Howard. We don't need you at the World Series of Poker. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, anytime you're responsible for for poker players losing hundreds of millions of dollars and and kind of doing that to community and upending people's lives, and we don't really know who's responsible for that or what took place. If it's irresponsibility in terms of how they how they uh, corresponded with the banks and right, they allegedly purchased a bank and that wasn't wasn't allowed to be able to do that so it'd be nice to kind of know what took place there what happened to the money for the player's sakes and yeah it sucks that these guys just kind of dropped off the face of the earth maybe 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 me or you can kind of get an interview with them and maybe get some answers 10 years later and figure out what the hell happened there huh yeah that'd be awesome i mean get wow. a little bit of closure when you think about it you know we're coming up on april 2021 10 years since black friday happened maybe you and i joey should combine forces and see if we can you know, get some sit-downs going with these guys. Well, that's what I'm saying, right? Maybe Ferguson wants to talk or Ray Batar is interested in kind of telling his story. And I, I mean, obviously from their perspectives, they might not want to bring attention to the situation now because we've already gone past, like no one's talking about it. People only have bad blood. So they might feel like what's there for me to gain by coming out and talking about my story to the community. But I know the community would greatly appreciate it. So, right. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, one, one more thing I want to mention, Sam Simon. I did not remember him um, you know, being a vocal point of high-stakes poker, but it's really awesome to see him here on the show. Loved the game of poker, played at the WSOP, um, was, you know, was with Jennifer Tilly for a long time, uh, sadly has passed away uh, back in 2015. Um, tremendous guy, did a lot for charity. Um, off the top of my head, was involved with a lot of animal charities. Um, so amazing guy, never had a chance to meet him, but it's cool to see him here on High Stakes Poker. And it makes, it makes running back, you know, even more cool to look back on because, you know, we forget about these moments and it's really cool that they're, that they're out there. Um, so glad, glad to be able to do this. That's really awesome. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think this is really cool. Let's just kind of go back and relive the poker history, see the guys who were the big ambassadors at the time, the legends of the game at the time too. You know what I mean? I think it's, I think it's really, it's a really cool concept, really cool show. Let's see if we can uh, catch some big hands here because I'm kind of curious if someone like Cassavetes is going to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, I remember, I mean, he didn't mix it up too much in these. And, you know, these guys probably were playing, they're, they're like playing with the, the greats at the poker, at the time at poker, you know what I mean? So I think these guys are probably a little bit intimidated by, uh, by I mean, Antonio Sfandiari, Daniel Negreanu, Patrick Antonius, Phil Locke. I mean... Yeah, I'd be... Let me, if you're let me, an amateur, Remco, you'd probably be a little freaked out by this lineup behind you if you're Nick Cassavetes. I, I would bring the kind of money that I would like to set on fire and then just, <laughs> and th and then just have fun with that. Um, and that, yeah. would, that would be it, probably. Um, let me ask you this. High Stakes okay. Duel, round one. Um, Esfandiari got beat by Phil Helmuth. Now we got round two coming up. You know, Give me your thoughts on the concept and your, and your sort of preview for round two, you know, which obviously, you know, has to happen soon because you want to see if uh, Helmuth can, can, you know, run the table on his Fendiari there. I think it's a fun show. I mean, people obviously are interested in it. They want to see these people, poker players talk that they know. So if you know Phil Helmuth and you know Antonio Fendiari, which a lot of long time poker American fans know those guys, I think that's like, it's like porn for them in some ways. So I think the concept's great. I think the show went down well. I think the branding was very nice. And I think a lot of people out there are excited to see them to play. Like they did, people just like watching poker. I think that's what it comes down to. They want to watch poker. They want to see people that they know. They want to hear players talk. They they want to hear commentators who can 
provide an entertaining experience. So I think the concept of the show is really good. I think yeah. people are excited to see the next one and, and go on from there to see who else steps up to the plate to compete. 200k match between Esfandiari and uh, Helmuth. After seeing round one, I just cannot imagine what Esfandiari will try to get under Helmuth's skin, which obviously, as we all know, is not very hard, but Antonio is particularly good at doing so. Um, <laughs> Joey, Antonio's table persona, let's, let's talk about that for a second here. How do you feel about the way he handles himself and how he always managed to get the upper hand in side bets and he, he sort of talks his way into the game? He's tight, but he talks aggressive, which means that people might have the wrong idea of how he really plays. So give me your per perception on, on Antonio. Uh, I think he's built like a real nice career for himself here and he's made a lot of friends and he sort of like knew a lot of these things uh, about who you know and the players that you play with, the networking, the going out to dinner with certain players or befriending certain players. Like he he was sort of on to that idea long before I think a lot of players were or really talked about it. So yeah, I mean, people want to be around someone who's personable and who's talking, who's making bets, who has stories, who isn't super boring, who's willing to give action. So I think he's got one of the best live poker personas that that you could kind of aspire to have in some ways if you want to play in really high stakes games against a variety of players. Do you think that people watching this show, what, no matter what level they play on, but do you think people watching this show can learn from someone like Antonio as far as table presence or is what he does too complicated and maybe too confusing for someone to apply themselves if they're trying to play their best game? I think that's what it is. It's really hard to be talking and, and, talking shit to people or needling people or making bets. It's really hard to stay on top of your game when you do that. So it takes time to build up that persona and also understand how people are going to adjust against you differently. Because I know when I play a lot of PLO and I'm talking a lot at the table, certain players are going to play against you completely different just because you're talking a lot. So that takes experience to be able to read, okay, who can I, who's, who's coming after me a little bit harder than normal potentially, or who's maybe playing a little bit tighter, who's maybe playing a little bit scared. And you always have to kind of worry about that too. But when you're playing as like a really talkative, aggressive player like that, and you seem like you're giving a lot of action, you never know how someone's going to adjust to you. So I think once you get good at understanding how people are adjusting to you, then uh, you can do really, really well. I mean, yeah, he probably does really, really well in the poker game season. He probably finds a lot of opportunity from people as well. And yeah, he's got a nice setup going on. So can you can you talk and play and, and, and be focused on two things at once? Definitely. Yeah. I think I've, I've played enough poker and played enough PLO specifically that, yeah, I've gotten a lot better at that. I worked at that though. When I played, I just went there, talked a lot and yeah, I tried to actively get better at, at figuring out, okay, how do you play this style, but still focus on how the game's playing because you're talking, you're not paying attention to what other people are doing. So it can be very distracting. So you're also missing information, but you're also not deeply thinking about your own play. So you're missing free information that's out there. So it's an art. You can kind of, talk and follow action, see what's happening, ask questions. Like the table talk is a whole, it's a whole part of the game of poker that I think is going to become more of a, of a quality you need to have as the high stakes games become more of like a private experience. Right. That's, that's a, that's a very good point. You know, being fun to play with is, is part of, you know, what makes you a good player in the sense that, you know, being a good player is also about more than just, you know, being able to play the cards. Um, Letterer making it 3K. Hashem flat calling with the Jacks after an early position raised from Letterer. Uh, Joey, the first thing that comes to mind is, are we watching a different form of poker compared to the last hour that we saw? Well, I think I think Joe Hashem was, uh, he was a World Series poker champion. So I don't know if he was a very experienced, super high stakes player. I imagine he came on here. He found out there were two recreational players in the game and he just wanted the experience. So playing a little bit more conservative against someone who's known to have a tighter reputation at the table doesn't seem like the worst play, right? Like kind of erring on the side of caution versus wanting to put the pedal to the metal. Plus this could have been the start of the session. He might not have wanted to get stacked. So there's a lot of factors to kind of take into account right. in terms of why he might have slow play a hand like this. I, I was more so taking a light jab at the fact that we just saw, you know, four-way preflop hands, 20K a pop with 9.7 uh -huh. off and four deuce. And now we're watching uh, premium pocket pairs, which is uh, it's a very, <laughs> very different realm. Um, <laughs> how do we feel about this, though? Letterer makes the flush, checks to Hashem, and Hashem goes for a stab here. Um, you know, is Hashem going to go two streets with bluffs? Uh, does, do, do his jacks have any showdown value left? Like, how do we feel in this uh, spot? I think that... 
this probably shows why he probably didn't play a ton of high stakes cash games. I think that's maybe what this shows, right? Right. Also, he might just be assuming that Howard might have might have bet the flop with a top pair, and now he's just going to give up. So maybe he thinks he's just folding enough here too. So it might not be a, a standard conventional type of play, but I mean, he's only bet what he bet half. He bet what did he bet one third pot or something like that? A little less than one third pot, a little yeah. more than one third pot or something like that. So yeah. And the letter, I don't know what the hell's happening here. Why, why would he check raise? Why, why would he I not just? I, I got, I got no idea. Maybe he thinks that this small. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even fathom to understand what the hell he's doing here. <laughs> I think both, both alternate. <laughs> I can't even like fathom to figure this to, to try to think what's. Happening. Maybe he thinks that this guy bet very small with a weak flush, trying to get a free showdown. I mean, I don't know what is going on in this hand. Oh my God, his hand's not over. Take that, professor. Wow. This what what are we what are we watching here? Okay, let me just say that if Letter just bets the turn normally, that that's probably you know totally fine. If you check calls, it's totally fine. And then he goes for the check raise, which is probably third on the ranking as far as your options on the turn, right? <laughs> wow, what a hand, what a play. I mean, listen, maybe the guy's a god, right? Who knows? <laughs> what? Hold on, did he just fold? I would not think that Joe has. Is this real? I don't know what happened that hand, Remco. That was uh, without a spade. That was dicey right there. That was dicey. I'm sorry, but I take it all back. Joe Hash. I mean, what could the guy real? What's the guy check raising small there with that he didn't bet? It does kind of look full of shit, doesn't it? it the guy, C bets flop, check raises small on the turn. It kind of looks like that he's he's full of it there. I mean, that's just a very. What very is Howard hand. doing with a ten high flush? Is he like check raising it for info on the turn? Like, what are you doing? I'm like lost. I'm I'm legit lost. Can someone in the chat please explain to me what I just watched? I am I am. Probably lost. doesn't think Joe Hashem is gonna re-raise him there without a, a very strong spade, right? So you can kind of understand Howard's thought process there. He check raised small. It looked like Joe had a weak hand. Maybe he want I don't know. It doesn't make sense. I mean, listen, when you own the poker side, buddy, you make fucking weird plays like that, right, Remco? Wow. You're check raising with the ten the ten spade, it's in your hand. You own the poker site, you lose the money, whatever, you go. You go check your piece and see how it's doing in the business. That is incredible. That is one of the most forgotten, interesting, weird hands that I've seen uh, as far as this old high stakes poker stuff. I'm le le legit blown away. Every single move that, that, that those players made on the turn were not what I would have done. And not to say that I'm a good player, but that is just very funny. Man, maybe they're just mixing yeah. it up, man. Not everyone really plays to play every hand perfectly. I right. think that's like that's a common misconception people have is that sometimes people just want to have a good time and they want to make a bluff and if they get called, they don't really care. Like they, it's all about the big blinds. It's not about the money to these people and they just want to make plays and mix it up. And I think there's such an over obsession on what the right play is or what the good play is or perfect play is that there isn't enough. There's not enough emphasis put on the excitement of just kind of doing whatever you want to do, like making a random play because you think the guy's full of shit and it's going to work. Right. And I think a lot of those plays used to get praise before, but now like people look down on plays like that because they don't think that they're, they think that the only way to play poker is to make the right play. When in reality, like, you can do whatever you want to do. And I think what makes a lot of fun is that you can take pocket jacks there and, and re-raise and bluff the guy off that. Like that's what makes the game fun. But there isn't enough emphasis put on that. And it's all about all, oh, you know, I got to do this according to this and this and that, like the nerds sort of like, uh, they made poker a little bit unexciting because th whenever they come on, they're always just like breaking things down from how things should be every single time. And they think that they know everything about every single hand because they can see the cards. So I think, uh, you know, plays like that are what we should be celebrating as well, too, because it's a fun play. I was celebrating it because I enjoyed that a lot, a lot more than most of the poker that we've seen tonight because it was so out of control and it was so crazy. And I think that that is part of the beauty of high stakes poker. And the fact that I was blown away by it just goes to show how much fun <laughs> that hand was to watch. But yeah, I mean, you were spot on there with what you said. I think that we are putting too much of an emphasis on perfect play. I think that we lose sight of how fun and exciting the game can be. Um, however... Howard and Joe clashing on the turn, you know, two yeah. stone, two stone faced guys, you know, usually known for a bit of a tight, aggressive style. You know, I would not necessarily call their playing styles to be that exciting, but this hand was very exciting. And the way it was played was definitely not in, in any of the books that, uh, that I, that I read back in the day. Shout I out mean, I don't think it needs to be in book. I think that's like this, this very common misconception is that everyone needs to play poker to win and, and needs to play poker to do well. And, 
And I just don't think that's true. And I think that the message that a lot of people have been putting out there is just, it's, it's scared away a lot of players because they think, oh, if I'm not playing well, like I'm going to get put down. You know, like a player comes on and he makes some fun plays because he doesn't give a fuck. And then you get made fun of by a bunch of dorks who are like, oh, what is he doing with the third pair there, right? Like the guy's just trying to have a good time. He doesn't care as much as you care. You care about these things a lot more than they care about it. This isn't a professional league. This isn't their career. This isn't their business. This isn't their life. Like they're just going on there to have a good time. This isn't like the NBA finals. It's just a bunch of people sitting around playing poker. Some are really good. Some aren't very good, but any of them still have a chance in any hand. And I think we kind of got away from that and we went way too far to the other side where like everyone's got to be perfect every time. And let's talk about the perfect play and every single time. And right. there's not enough just entertainment. I think it's what Mike Sexton did well, right? Talking shout to Mike Sexton, but he was always able to bridge that gap. And I think the best commentators are able to bridge that gap between letting the the regular kind of player understand how the game works and not always putting plays down for why people made it. Oh, 100% agree with you. That's that's definitely true. Um, we got his friend Yar here with the race. Hashim with the call. Hashim not really three betting a lot. We don't see a lot of aggression from him, which I was sort of, in my mind, I always have Hashim as, a, as an aggressive player, uh, but he definitely played a coy here before the flop. I, ho I hope, I, mean, I we, hope. We, we did see him with those pocket jacks take it to the streets, so that was pretty aggressive, I thought. That, that is very aggressive. I was hoping Cassavetes would get wild there with the 9-4 suited. I highly encourage raising with suited cards. That's one of my favorite plays. You, uh, like to ra you like to raise with suited cards. Suited, I'm a big fan of suited cards, putting it out we'll, there. We'll remember that when we yeah. all play, when we, we ever play with you. I, I play my flush draws very aggressively, just so everyone like knows. Like Daniel put in 200000 earlier in the match, you <laughs> like to do that. You just put your stack in there with the flush draw. Exactly. I'm a flush draw player. What can I say? Not, not a big fan of the straight draw. I'm a flush draw guy. Nothing uh, wrong with that. Exactly. Uh, Cormac is saying that we're silly and that this is ridiculous that we're talking about these hands. Well... The, isn't that part of the fun? How ridiculous this is? How cool this is that we have the ability to watch some of this stuff? I think um, a lot of people are having quite a bit of fun with this. So uh, Tom Carilla is saying, hey, Remco, is Gabe going to be back for the new high-stakes poker? Well, yeah, to, be, to be honest, I would love to know as well. Gabe, if you're watching, please let me know. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Season 8 of high-stakes poker is coming to PokerGo. I do know that, and I do know that a lot of stuff is being done behind the scenes. My, 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 my uh, mentor... And my friend, Mori Eskandani, of course, behind the scenes, working you know, as hard as possible to get all that stuff together. And I'm pretty sure that he has Gabe's phone number. So we'll have to wait and see uh, about High Stakes Poker Season 8. But uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to be some of the most exciting poker that you've ever seen. Because obviously, it's 2020. We've got, we got some big bankrolls and some big stacks and some big names that we want to invite. Um, Perfect. I'm, I'm just excited about this. I don't even... Like, Brent Hanks and Mori Eskandani are like the dream team as far as putting lineups together and getting all that stuff going. So I have mm -hmm. all the faith in the world in these guys. I hope so. I hope they put on some, some great games. I think the players are ready for it, man. The fans are ready to watch it. Exactly. We've um, been watching these, we've been watching these live streams for so long. We're ready to, we're ready to watch some, uh, some nice high quality content, man. Exactly. Um, on the, on the subject of, of season eight of high stakes poker, Joey, who, who do you think um, should be on there from the newer wave of players. We all, we all know the classic names, but are there any limitless man? We got to get limitless. We got to We got to fly him over from wherever, wherever uh, Russian penthouse he's in to come play that game, man. You know, we got to get some exciting personalities on there. Some people that players want to see that are making a name for themselves that are currently battling in the high stakes games as well, too. All the boring guys that sit there and don't say anything, right? Maybe they got another, maybe there's another show for those guys to play on Remco. I think we got to get, Maybe be a little bit more uh, selective of the lineups, right? People ideally know each other. There's like a, they blend together a little bit. Yeah, that'd be I, ideal. What about what do you think? I think I think matching the personalities and and getting people together that are comfortable with each other is is a big a big thing. Like for instance, I'm just gonna name a side street. If Michael Phelps wanted to play on high stakes poker, you put Bill Perkins and Antonio in the game because th those are his friends. Those are the people that he's comfortable playing with. I think that is a, a good way to approach it. If you get the right combination of personalities that know each other, then you're going to have the best game. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Remco. I agree. That's ideal, right? Like that's what makes a lot of these shows good is you see the people play regularly together with each other and they build camaraderie. There's needling, there's jabbing. Like if the players don't know each other, then you end up at a table where no one's talking because 
one person should maybe trying to force the conversation and that could go well sometimes and other times it can go really bad right uh, by the way, shout out to Sam Simon who just casually folded the pocket jacks to a raise from Nick Cassavetes on the seven seven flop. He knew. He knew right away. Um, Remco, let me go to the bathroom real quick. Yeah. We're a couple hours into this bad boy, okay? Let's do it. I'm gonna go keep rolling and play keep some of this rolling. audio. All right, we got Nick Cassavetes talking. That might not be. You know, let's see what he has to say. How to play, and uh, that hasn't changed too much. Dude, he wrote blow. Can we just talk about that? The guy wrote blow. One of the greatest. He wrote blow right there. He wrote blow. Yeah, that guy right there. So sick. I started going down to the casino. I live in Los Cla Classic Antonio there uh, talking about Nick Cassavetes. For the people in the chat, if you have any questions for Joey, you know, please send them in. We got High Stakes Boker here rolling season five. We got quite a few more big hands still to come. And clearly, we got lots of excitement building in the chat on both Facebook and YouTube about the upcoming season eight of High Stakes Poker. Um, let's see if we can, you know, get some more epic hands to play here on this show. Um, Sam Simon just fold pocket jacks. Pretty impressive fold there by him on the 7-7 flop. Um, Joey, good to have you back, obviously. Thank you. I'm good to be back. Yeah, obviously people are excited about some, some watching some new poker, right? Especially with COVID, it's kind of taking out all the live poker. So I think people are starving for it. They've been watching people with these live streams. They want to see some real life people, man. So. Yeah, it, it's definitely weird. Uh, do, do you think that we're at all close to, I don't know, live tournaments? Like, do you think it's even possible this year still? Uh, well, they're doing live tournaments in, uh, in King's Casino. I know they're out there. There's some live tournaments here at the Mid Stakes Poker. The, what is it? Mid MSPT, right? So they're doing some tournaments. Phoenician's doing tournaments. Uh, will there be like event style tournaments where there's production involved? Probably not. Doesn't seem that way. But we're still early. You never know what happens, right? You never know what goes on here in Vegas and potentially numbers get better. I, I try to disconnect myself whenever I think about poker. I disconnect myself from what's happening in the real world out there in terms of uh, the lockdown and what's happening in all the different countries out there and what might happen here in the future. So I try to not to think too much about it when I think about poker, but um, obviously poker's coming back at some point in time. So yeah. there'll be poker content in the future. There'll be live poker back in the future. People won't be wearing masks forever. So, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic. And I think when it comes back, it's going to be people are going to be really excited to play. Exactly. So that's what I'm excited about, man. I'm excited about Cassavetes right now. He's raises with the 7 6 off. I hope he gets creative here against this Fandiari who three bets in with the jack five off. So you can see, you mentioned before Antonio was like a tighter player, but you, this is what he does against recreational players is he gives a lot of action. He doesn't mind three betting the jack five, talks to him, kind of sees where they're at. He, like he, that's, this is what he does, man. This is what makes him, I think, really good. <laughs> do you will you make that bet with me if i show you a card which bet that who wants to be in your movie i want to be in your movie <laughs> you got you had on a free roll i already told you for how much is the free roll it's he, he's in the movie on a free roll oh he's on the movie on a my free word roll. is my bond yeah you're gonna be, i'm in your movies yeah. i'm going to be in the movies <laughs> <laughs> finally yes i'm going to be in the movies daniel can i be your driver <laughs> so now show me a card Shine both cards now yeah, show me. Just, yeah, just show them. Away. <laughs> <laughs> now show them both cards. I he's can't show them both. Away. It doesn't matter if it's a bluff or not. Yeah, this one. Show them that one. Show them the what? Pick one. The one closest. Yeah, this one. No, no, that's not the one. That was the other one. Oh, that one. That wins. That's good. <laughs> that was good enough. <laughs> that's good enough. Show them the jack. And you're in the movie. Show them both cards, and you'll never work in this town again. Nice hand, sir. Thank you. I can tell you, we did play a game the other day that was fun. We got to we got to have a fact checker out there watching the show trying to see if Antonio made any appearances in Nick Cassavetes productions because otherwise he still owes him one. For a couple rounds, one round at least. Let's What's do a big deal. Round. I mean, why don't no. you why don't we just show both every hand? Let's, let's play so seven bold. deuce. Why not? What's you know what we played the other show day? One. Seven What's deuce and six thing? deuce. What do we have got money from everybody? I like the idea of the winner shows what he had. How about the end? Everyone turns That's their hand up. That's a great game. If everyone. you have a let's hand. Do well, seven everyone at home gets to see him. We might as well, too. Seven deuce, everybody pays you a thousand. Look, I can't play the seven deuce game. Why not? Because I bluff with the seven deuce. And, and now it works, but now, now it doesn't work as well. Oh, come on, Howard. Antonio's Shut still up. still trying to get the seven deuce game on, but Howard. That is the lamest argument against the seven deuce game I've ever heard. Joey, seven deuce game, good for the game, bad for the game. I think it's great. I don't know, man. It isn't a lot of fun. It like, creates a lot of action. You never know what's going on. You might get bluffed in some spots, and uh, that really hurts, but 
I'm sure that some players do really well with the seven deuce game and, and other players really hate it. But right. if you're like a good player and a good game and you're already going to win money because people are playing loose, like you probably don't want the seven deuce game. So, but I'm sure like other players like getting professionals out of their comfort zone too. So then they're going to like the seven deuce game. You know what I mean? Right. Because if sometimes if, if you're kind of have an advantage over someone else and figure out a new game type, which is something we talked about earlier, then, uh, right, you're going to be able to do well. So maybe some of these bad players, the weaker players, don't necessarily know how to balance their, their ranges that well when they're bluffing with seven deuce. So for better players, it's actually better that they're bluffing more often and uh, probably gives you an advantage. So I would probably want to have the seven deuce game on if I was a good player playing uh, Texas Hold'em. Exactly. Um, on the, the subject of Antonio's playing style, he just three bet with 6 4 offsuit. Hashem called out of position with the ace king. 6 6 deuce on the flop. What more <laughs> can you ask for? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 isn't that what you want? Can get away from this hand on the flop. Um, also, let me ask you this. Is there a 7-deuce um, uh, variant that applies to PLO? or is PLO? Uh, sometimes we play, like, if you have quads in your hand, which is just hard to get, though. So maybe trips in your hand, you could play some version like that, in your, too. But if I ever get quads in my hand playing PLO, I'm just taking it to the street. I'm, I'm <laughs> at least seeing the flop so I can try to bluff my blockers. Of course. So I think he'll call There's actually a guy named Yorubu who's from Brazil, a uh, longtime PLO player. He would always try to bluff his blockers and then post the hands on the forums and everyone get excited. And he definitely lost a lot of money in some big pots when he kept doing that. So he was like a guy that took that idea a little bit too far, I think. That's funny. I, I always respect the guys who are willing to go after it at all costs. My kids, yeah, but my kids, <laughs> so my kids not my wife. <laughs> you can see Antonio a little bit here in position, three bets, a tighter player, especially someone uh, who doesn't have that much experience maybe playing the higher stakes cash game. So you can see Antonio is willing to mix it up against certain players. He's not always playing like a really tight style. Right. And then he makes some prop at uh, do some push-ups and, you know, he collects some extra money on the side, which... Uh, Obviously, it's part of the hustle too. He also he also invented the Laden's Laden thinks uh, with Phil Locke and uh, Johnny Laden at the World Series of Poker Europe, I believe, back in two thousand and seven or eight. Um, that game really took off and became sort of a staple of of, of live games. Is that, is that still a thing, uh, Joey? Yeah, I think it's like a good thing if you like to prop bet and kind of get people out of their comfort zone. And anytime you can do these bets at the table, it just creates more action for the game because people see each other betting some people get stuck they want to play more hands so anytime you can do something like that that creates that sort of environment at the table and just gets people drinking gets them excited it gets them having a good time i think that's the kind of ideal live poker situation that you want to have and also if you're an experienced prop better like antonio is you pick up uh, a lot of possible equity in your bets right so you get to make extra money on the betting side of things why would you not play a lot and things. Why would you not try to encourage people to play that as much as you can? Exactly. Um, as nightfall starts to roll into Las Vegas and my natural sunlight, which creates this <laughs> beautiful scenery, um, is is uh, fading out of my small little <laughs> apartment. Um, it's getting a little bit dark over here. We are still watching season five of High Stakes Poker. If you enjoy the show, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. Every single Wednesday, by the way, on both YouTube. It's getting dark over there, Remco. <laughs> you're right. Are you, are, you, are, you doing, are you doing any nighttime bike rides? I know that you're big in the bike. I don't know if people know that you're becoming a bike a biking influencer on Instagram with your beautiful photos and your long bike rides. I'm, I am trying to be as fit as I can be, and it's, it's going pretty well. But yeah, what I was going to say is that every, every, every Wednesday on YouTube and Facebook, we have the top five WSOP main event hands. We are into 2015. We've got 16, 17, 18, and 19 coming up in the coming weeks. So if you do love the World Series of Poker, check out those top fives. And please, I made them. I put them together. Let me know how wrong I was. And, and remind, me of, <laughs> remind me of the hands that I missed out on in the comments because I do read all of those. And I'm curious to see if you guys found any more hands. By the way, next week, Will Kasuf. Just... just, just strap in for the Wilkesuf experience because he was he was very very big part of 2016 and then just can you cannot make a top five hands without check your privilege it's just part of the part of the hand Wilkesuf um, the leg legend of the world series poker definitely made the 2016 main event uh very colorful um we've got a lot of brazil in the chat right now really appreciate I that. See that yeah that's awesome um sam simons phil lock going head to head with uh the old 10 high Someone said, what happened to Sam Abernathy? She's still on Instagram right now. She's still, she's still out there doing a lot of things. She's a very creative, creative person. I think she got married, and she knows a lot of people got a lot of opportunity out there. So doesn't need to grind poker as much all the time if she doesn't want to. Right. We got a, we got a pot brewing here. Yeah. Huh, Remco? Sam Simon mixed it up with the 10-4 offsuit and flopped the open in a straight draw. 
I think this is bad news for Sam Simon if Ooh, the brick. This is really a case of uh, amateur playing against a professional. Wow. Phil Locke knows that Sam Simon did not want to see that ace of diamonds. You can do any cap you want. I mean, is there a cap you like? Yeah, if Sam re-raised with kings or queens or now he's in a pretty bad spot. So Phil Locke is, is paying attention to that. Yeah, definitely. That's a big one for Phil Locke. Continues to talk and go way over 78. I lost like 300 cap. Word 87. He's over. I was counting. He said, I knew he would say more than 78 words. He was way over 78. <laughs> they, I guess they prop bet on how many words Patrick would say for the entire session. The line was set at 78, which is a great lot of things question. But in this case, <laughs> it was actually a real bet, which is even funnier. Um, that was really funny. Um, we got, yeah, for people in the chat who are wondering, uh, Kasuv on Tuesday, no, that's that's going to be uh, next Wednesday. The top five hands from the 2016 main event, Will Kasuv makes an appearance in that. Uh, check your privilege, guys. Come on. Um, let's stay with the game. Um, next week on Tuesday, by the way, Reiner Kempe on the show watching the 2016 Super High Rollable final table. That's going to be quite something. Um, a lot of big hands to break down from that final table. Um, Sam Simon just got caught, and I guess... Uh, Lost with the same hand that Phil Locke had, who was more aggressive. There's Hashim again. Wow, this guy keeps picking up hands. Let's see if, she, <laughs> if he can make some magic happen with the kings here. So you're not going to have Will Kasuf on soon? I don't think so, no. I, I, the problem with that is is that I would not need my microphone. I could just I could just go have lunch, and he'll just talk for four hours. If, if you and Will, I, could see, I could see you and Will Kasuf being, uh, he wouldn't, you wouldn't get much words in for sure. He is uh, unstoppable, as some would say. Yeah, that guy's a big talker, man. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I haven't seen him, and uh, I haven't talked to him in a few years. So, uh oh. Kings for Hashim. See if Joe lays his hand down here. <laughs> Hashim bets seven thousand. McGrowney with that nice uh, sweater over the button-up shirt. I like that look. Yeah, you you fold you fold over the what do they call what, what do they call that the cuffs? I don't know. The cuffs. Yeah, I mean we, we we imagine seeing him with that look these days, right? I mean now he's like now he's wearing the tank tops all the time, and he has gone like full tank top mode here. It seems like. I mean, maybe he was inspired by you, Joey. You think so? Maybe he's a few years behind. I mean, I used to wear tank tops all the time on my content. Now, now not as much anymore, but. You're right. Maybe he was inspired by those old episodes I did with my tank top on. It, it pleases me that I heard a chip fall just now. I'm like, I'm like shuffling chips as we speak. It's just yeah, I I'm just, shuffling chips too. I can't. I just, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I got a, I got a whole stack here. So, it's uh. Let's see if we have a taker. <laughs> if you're watching this at home and shuffling chips, please let me know because I feel as though <laughs> yeah, I always, I'm always start shuffling chips a lot lately. Plus, you get better at your chip tricks a little bit, and yeah. you kind of practice a few moves depending on what move you like to do. It is, it is funny. Like I even have a stack of chips at my desk in the PokerGo offices. Just, have you guys been going to the studio at all lately? No, not, not, not so much, uh, but I've been going to the office, creating all the content, trying to make sure we're ready for when everything returns. And of course, gearing up for High Stakes Duel Round 2, which will happen later this month. More on that, Let's go. More on that as soon as we have it, of course, between Antonio and Phil. Uh, stay tuned for the announcement on when that will happen, but that's going to be a big one. Hashim top set. That takes it down. That's a big one. My name is Joe Hashim. My name is Joe Hashim. <laughs> I, I won the World Series. <laughs> I Tron I Wagon said, uh, what is your favorite season of high stakes poker? Hmm. Uh, his is when 500K with Farhan Gold. I think that's my favorite. When Gil Liberté is in the mix and Jamie Gold's in the mix and you get to see two big bluffers going up against each other and there's that big David Benjamin hand and Sammy Farha is really deep playing a lot of hands. There's that hand with Farha and Patrick Antonius, I think, as well, too. So... Yeah, the Jack Nine, the Jack Nine hand. That's that's one of my favorites. Yeah, the Jack Nine. Are you flushing when there's the big big conversation back and forth with each other? I mean, yeah, those are those are some classic hands, man. Those yeah, just... I think season four is probably the best season they've ever made, and then the second best season is either three or five. I think it's between those two. Um, that that middle ground was definitely the best. So I think I think it's four, then five, then the three, two, one, six, seven. That's that's their power rankings for high stakes poker seasons. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's the one. Makes sense. 
On what kind of rating? You've heard of it. Zero to hundred. Nick Cassavetes um, is going to give to Pulp Fiction. Uh, Joel Turner on Facebook is asking, what year is this? Well, it's uh, 2020 right now, and that's why we are watching Run It Back, because we have no live poker to talk about. Uh, this is actually from 2009, High Stakes Poker, back in the day when that was taped. Season 5, if you're keeping score, you can watch all seven seasons on Poker Go in case you want to dive back into the archives. Uh, we are doing this live, so if you have any questions, please send them in. Um, Taj Carroll is asking, who's your favorite table talker from High Stakes? Oh. Mine is Farha. Farha Farha is definitely way up there. Jamie Gold, let's not forget about him. Brad Booth had some good one-liners. Um, definitely chirped at Ivy a little bit, which was awesome. Um, yeah, there, we there never really saw anyone chirp at Phil Ivy, so that's like a very rare thing to see someone kind of take a shot at him. Yeah, that was that was epic. Pair of sevens and an inside straight draw. He's going to lead out. Antonio playing a lot looser this session. Yeah. He's also raising into Phil Locke. And Phil Locke had a nice rivalry with each other, too. So he was always trying to uh, go after each other, and they were trying to play big hands and stuff like that. NB is saying Patrick is so hot. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. <laughs> I, as, as a man, I can say that, that Patrick is... The is former a, male model, of course, it was always in his thing. Former tennis player. He still works out all the time. He's always posting on his Instagram page right now of him him working out, Remco. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, he's uh, he was a tennis tennis pro, and Gus Hansen was Gus also tennis, or was he like more? Back I think Gus was maybe. I think Gus played tennis too. He was big into the tennis world. Right, um, Eon McHenry, who um, might be watching the show in in um, going back in time, as he was as he's asking right now about something we discussed about an hour ago. He says, "How how did you fare in Bobby's room? Did you make a profit?" Oh, when I played, yeah, it went pretty well. I think I made about like uh, almost a buy-in. Nice. But I, I, it didn't last very long. It was very late in the night when I finally got into the game, and the game kind of broke pretty quickly, which I was confused by. But I guess in retrospect, if you see a young kid come in there, you probably don't think he's uh, a really bad player, like a super fish kind of guy. So, yeah, the game went for a little bit, and it broke probably about two hours into it. And then the first hand that I played, I flopped the nut flush blocker, and I decided I was going to lose all my money if somebody called me down. But luckily, they folded. And I've never, my heart never beat faster, Remco. I mean, playing like first time you play really big pots or really big stakes live, your your heart's beating fast. It's it's a unique experience. You know what I mean? It it is. I mean, whenever the, the threshold gets put pushed up further, first it's a twenty dollar buy in, then it's a hundred dollar buy in. Whatever, whenever you reach that new level, you got to break through that ceiling, and and that's when the heart really starts pumping. And I can totally relate to that, even though. The biggest pot I ever played was like 1200 bucks, but I still totally relate to it. Yeah, I mean, it's all relative, right? It's all like in big blinds technically, but the money is what makes the game of poker so unique is that there is money up for stakes and uh, everyone reacts to that differently. And some people can handle it. Some people can't. Some people are so programmed by money in certain ways that they just can't get it out of their head that they're gambling for that much. And that's a big roadblock for a lot of people and why they don't make it to certain stakes is because they think, oh, I've lost this real world amount of money how am i ever going to possibly recover when in reality it's it you don't think about it that way it's it's you're, you're thinking about it in an incorrect way but it's very easy to let that kind of mind fuck you and really hold you back from moving to higher income or next level or playing in, in some good games where you have a good chance to win but you're just kind of scared to, to put it on the line right so that's definitely very true man appreciate all the insights um Joey, what I'm curious about in in this case, 2020 right now, you know, what's 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 next for you? What's next this year? Have you have a, do you have a, a roadmap for the next few weeks? Are we going to see you do more content? What's happening? Yeah, I'm done. I'm going to take. I'm t I've, been, I've been like grinding hard on Twitter uh, over these since like since coronavirus happened and, and that went down. But I started doing YouTube again. My YouTube content's doing really well. People are loving it. Comments are high. Engagement's really high. I'm trying out some new formats, which is cool. But I think a lot of my study is mainly on on content and content formats and content production and and uh, I really want to test myself on YouTube specifically and I think there's a lot of attention on poker right now versus like Twitter it's all politics so it's not very useful to spend a lot of your time doing poker or talking poker on Twitter when a lot of the attention isn't there so I think I'm just gonna do more YouTube stuff and really focus in and try to work with some other companies who I think are doing a good job you know kind of explore those collaborations and possibilities out there. And uh, yeah, find out exactly what I want to do moving forward, whether I want to go into more of like uh, working with operators, working with poker sites, or if I want to look at potentially getting involved with my own poker site at some point in time, or that's sort of what I'm weighing right now, exactly what part of the business I want to be in, man. 
poppypoker.com do you have the url joey stars joey <laughs> stars but i mean you listen you can work with one of these sites and if you study the regulations and licenses how they work in america there's certain companies that have licenses you can work with those companies or you could you could uh figure out how to get licenses there's there's a few different ideas you could try and that's if you stay in poker but there's a big world outside of poker too so exactly all right yeah. for for um as far as this action goes, we have reached the end of this episode of High Stakes Poker. And with that, also, by the way, shout out to this hand. This hand was my favorite hand of the night, probably. Um, <laughs> we have reached the end of this show. For everyone watching, please, before you hit the door, hit the like button. And don't Thank forget you. to please subscribe hit the like to the channel. Button, please. Also, go over to Joe Ingram 1 on YouTube. So don't forget to subscribe there as well. A lot of good content on Joey's channel. Great interviews with some of the best players in the world. Joey has all the insights and all the good analogies and Thank angles you, and everything else that's going on there as well. Um, you already follow Joey on Twitter, but please, you know, find him on there as well. If you just look at, was is, is Chicago Joey on there? You, you, you're still not. Uh, you, Joey, Joey Ingram one on, on Twitter. Yeah. Boom. Same as on YouTube. That's very easy to remember for people. So go follow him on there. Stay tuned to this channel for much more. We have, this is going to be funny. We have the top five Matt Damon poker hands on this channel tomorrow, oh God, tomorrow really? morning. That's going to be really funny. Um, we also have um, more running back shows coming next week. we got uh, Reiner Campy on the show watching the 2016 Super High Roller Bowl. So that's going to be great. And then in the future, we're going to break down all these Super High Roller Bowl final tables. We've got Brian Rass coming on the show. Jason Kuhn coming on the show. Fedor Holtz is coming on the show. Um, lots of big stars joining me. And then, I, Joey, I want to have you back on the show to watch some PLO. How about we do that the next time? Let's do it. I'd, I'd love to, man. There's some great poker after dark episodes with uh there's two weeks of it so there you go <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do i it. mean there is some newer ones i played on poker after dark i think it was last year too right with, uh, with bill goff on and those guys so we could always watch that back would you rather watch yourself or watch some old school stuff oh i think i'd rather watch them myself i was on i've never watched those back that i remember i lost a few hands in there that could be a lot of fun do it we'll, we'll do it we'll do a long show we'll break it all down i'll i'll, t I'll talk to the editors the guys to make sure that we have a, a good show to go through so um it's a date Let's, let's let's say let's say end of October. We'll circle back on this. We'll do a new show. We'll do PLO. We'll bring all the people in here. I might crack open a beer because I'm in a weight loss bed right now, so I can't really drink. Uh, but then by then it'll be over. I'll be very fit. It'll be very healthy. I'll crack open a drink. Uh, Joey, thanks so much once again for being on the show. Everybody Thank watching, you, brother. Thanks so much for being with me. This was Run It Back. We'll catch you guys on Tuesday.